I would say, attention to it, and especially to the aspect of the rights of minorities. Uh, I think this is an essential uh, issue to uh, reflect on in the case of Italy, which, uh, although, as I will explain, it had a, a certainly something called the liberal state, it never really created a, a, a very uh, and completely secular state. <laughs> we do not have it even today. Um, we just, if we just remember all the polemics about uh, the question of the crucifix uh, in public schools uh, recently. So we've, we've been witnessing a whole uh, uh, strong debate on the meaning still of religion today uh, in Italian society, a society that is changing, is becoming multicultural, and it seems to have a lot of uh, issues with that. So I'm, I'm glad to be here to be offered the possibility of listening to uh, experts uh, in the field because uh, you should be aware that I'm not really a historian, <laughs> I'm not at all a historian of the, the relationships between uh, uh, church and state uh, in Italy. In fact, I'm a historian of nationalism, but certainly nationalism as a political religion, if we want <laughs> to call it. Uh, um, uh, has something to do with religion, and um, I've been uh, interested more recently in uh, sort of focusing a bit more on, in my own <coughs> research on on the way. Well, uh, I've been studying the, the construction of the nation in Italy, uh, perhaps not devoting uh, originally enough attention also to uh, to religion, uh, the, uh, the relationship between nation and religion, because. Uh, I looked at nationalism as a political religion in itself, and that way of looking at nationalism somehow uh, <laughs> puts the religion on a side. And I have to say that in the recent uh, season of uh, studies on nationalism, that's that's quite true. Um, they are innovative, and at the same time, they leave this uh, important issue issue again uh, still on the side. So. <clears throat> Well, the title that I've given to, longish title that I've given to my, uh, to my talk may sound uh, a bit strange because uh, why to re-Christianize the nation um, uh, after the war or during the war? Um, were the Italians not Catholic already? Were they not Catholic enough? Uh, and wasn't the Roman Catholic uh, religion inscribed in the constitution of the Kingdom of Italy, uh, the, eight, uh, the 1848 Statuto that Italy inherited from, uh, from Piedmont, uh, and it was inscribed, uh, reading Article 1, as the um, only religion, the only religion of the state, uh, while other religions uh, defined as cults were only tolerated. Uh, yes, so, so the answer is a rhetorical question. The answer is yes, it was. And there was indeed what could uh, seem uh, as a bit of a paradox in the Italian state created in 1861. It was a state inspired by liberal principles, which also introduced a, a range of anti clerical policies in the 1860s and 1870s. 70s, but uh, uh, as it was true of most uh, states in Europe at the time, it had a state, uh, uh, a state religion. Uh, however, in contrast to other states at the time, uh, the Italian state also had, at least until uh, 1878, uh, uh, a relentless enemy uh, who made it look somewhat more liberal than it really was, uh, Pius IX. Uh, who led an intransigent, as we all know, an intransigent, intransigent opposition to the entity uh, created by Cavour and Garibaldi. Uh, not only did he uh, excommunicate the makers of Italy, he also notorious, notoriously condemned the emancipations of Protestants uh, and Jews in the newly Italy, uh, by defining, uh, in the newly created Italy, by defining uh, Italian liberals as uh, uh, Novi Judei, uh, the new Jews, uh, and their construction, their society, the synagogue of Satan. Now, by saying this, I do not want to say <coughs> that the Italian state <coughs> was liberal only because of the church intransigent opposition to it. <coughs> uh, Jewish and Protestant emancipation and religious freedom uh, were real. And starting in 1877, the teaching of Catholicism was not imposed in private schools, 
although it was not forbidden either, uh, the, law, uh, the law was ambiguous uh, in this respect. And according to the political color, local municipalities which were in charge of, um, of uh, providing uh, education at the elementary level, uh, they uh, decided on the issue. But at least, uh, uh, let's say, until um, uh, the, the penal code introduced by Zanardelli in, uh, in 1889 eliminated the reference to Catholicism as a state religion. So we could say that at least from that point on, there was a, not, let's say, this kind of uh, uh, um, um, article limiting uh, the uh, uh, and defining the role of other cults. In, uh, <clears throat> so in sum, in spite of various compromises that the liberals made, Catholicism in the liberal states certainly did not have all the privileges that it was to obtain in 1929 with the, the liberal uh, pacts. However, as we know, over the period, over the liberal period, right, the period of the liberal state, things changed. Uh, we have been already told yesterday about uh, uh, about some of the reasons for these changes, and I want to just very briefly uh, go back to that. Uh, so already by the early 20th century, particularly by the time Italy entered the war in 1915, uh, the relationship between the Catholic Church and the Italian state and society more generally was no longer uh, as <coughs> distant as it was uh, at the time when Pius IX ruled the church. Uh, there were several reasons, right? We have mentioned uh, socialism, of course, the struggle against socialism that uh, Catholics, uh, uh, that the church and also liberals, of course, were interested in. Uh, there was colonialism, which is also has been mentioned, and I want to say a couple of things about these things. And then uh, I want to focus on, a, uh, on the more general reasons uh, that had to do with uh, the very desire on the part of many Catholics to see a reconciliation between church and state that would affirm, that would also affirm what they saw as a fundamental component of Italian identity, uh, namely Catholicism. Right? The Great War provided uh, the, <coughs> the ground, we could say, in which this rapprochement finally occurred uh, on a major scale. Now, uh, mentioning, we mentioned um, uh, anti-socialism, right, as one of the grounds for the rapprochement. Uh, the successor of Pius IX, uh, Leo XIII, was already much more worried about the issue, uh, about this issue than <coughs> other issues, right? He was worried about the attraction that a strongly anti-clerical socialism among the working classes uh, could uh, uh, could um, uh, realize, uh, and he uh, significantly addressed the social question, the uh, elaborating a, spe a specifically social Catholic vision of the economy in order to prepare to the church to face uh, the socialist challenge, uh, while rejecting the excesses of unbridled capitalism, the Catholic social doctrine rejected also the socialist denial of the virtues of private property as pretty much heresy. Now, the, um, for the late 19th century uh, church, socialism became an enemy even worse than liberalism. As in the case of liberalism, the church so the socialist brand of anti-clericalism as an, an evil leading to a degeneration of the true identity of the Italians, which for the church, uh, for many Catholics, was a Catholic identity. An identity that, again, that was uh, supposed to be rooted in this religion. Uh, we must recall that this view of the close relationship between Catholicism and Italian identity was also the view of the neo uh during the resurgiment of figures, of course, such as uh, Vincenzo Gioberti, to uh, whom I want to return later in connection with the developments after the war. But also the vision of Cesare Valvo, who did not share, uh, that in spite of not sharing all the views of Gioberti, uh, was deeply Catholic. Uh, and I remember reading uh, a piece, uh, a kind of novel that he wrote. It's not one of the things most known by, uh, by uh, uh, Valvo, but it's a novel about, uh, about a co the conversion of a Jew, which is, uh, again, always part of the Catholic mindset. 
uh, at the time. So um, under the pressure of mass politics, the church was identifying right, the socialist as uh, the enemy. Uh, and we, we, we mentioned uh, yesterday, uh, as we mentioned also, uh, Giovanni Gelliti's contribution to uh, the rapprochement between uh, liberals and Catholics uh, when he needed to court the Catholic vote. Uh, in the first elections, uh, after the widening of the suffrage uh, in the Gentiloni Pact of 1913. Now, uh, even without uh, its own party, Catholicism, by the turn of the 20th century, had become a player uh, stronger than liberalism in the arena of mass politics. So mass politics makes, uh, makes uh, a very important difference here. Uh, the presence of organized Catholicism in Italian society grew in the first uh, decade of uh, the new uh, century. Mass organizations such as the Gioventù Cattolica, in particular, but also women's organization, Catholic uh, women's organization, uh, grew uh, um, and were established actually right at the time. So the presence of, of Catholicism political Catholicism in Italian society, again, in spite of the absence of Catholic party, was already quite, quite evident. Now, uh, another important road uh, to the rapprochement between church and liberal state was colonialism. In the 1880s, at the time of Leo's pontificate, the Italian state began to develop a colonial policy, and many in the Catholic clergy so an opportunity for a much enhanced role in Italian society. Uh, missionaries supported the alleged civilizing mission, which all governments in Europe at the time uh, used to justify uh, their colonial expansion. In fact, one of the ways uh, to justify colonialism and imperialism was through the anti-slavery society established in Italy in 1888, thanks to the work of uh, a French Catholic bishop uh, who had already established a similar society in France, Cardinal uh, Lavigeri, who was, uh, just to give you a sense of the individual, was a strong supporter of the alleged humanitarian mission of King Leopold II uh, in the Congo Basin, right? Which we know, we will, we know well, but it served to cover cover other purposes. Uh, the church in the uh, in, uh, at the time claimed the cause of anti-slavery and as its own, as an expression of the Christian matrix of liberty and equality. Catholics in favor of reconciliation embraced some versions of nationalism by then by supporting the colonial efforts. Uh, for example, those uh, uh, around the, the journal that, uh, called the Rassegna Nazionale, founded in Florence in 1879. Uh, although, to move to the Libyan War and getting closer to the period that we're in, more interested in, um, to, uh, not, not, not all Catholics uh, supported the Libyan War, but important prelates, uh, in, uh, important um, um, bishops and uh, cardinals, such as the Cardinal Pietro Maffi, in Pisa, uh, openly supported it uh, because uh, it would bring the true religion, right, the true religion among infidels. In spite of differences, the church as a whole, uh, by not taking an oppositional stance, uh, provided a legitimation to Italian expansionism in Africa. Uh, and this is something that uh, Lucia Ceci, in her wonderful work uh, on the relationship between church and state, on, on, on these issues, on, on several issues, as pointed out, especially in relation to uh, expansionism. So the silence of the church, right, so there were maybe division uh, within uh, the Catholics uh, faithful, uh, the church in itself uh, um, uh, was a silence in, in, in cases of aggression, of colonial aggression. <laughs> in, um, in spite of the um, by the, by the time of the war, and in spite of the rapprochement that uh, uh, occurred on these grounds uh, of uh, uh, colonialism, of um, anti-socialism, by the eve of the Great War, uh, the Roman question, however, we know, had not, been, uh, had not yet found a solution. Um, and the prospect of war at first uh, seemed to produce uh, new frictions uh, between church and state. 
because the majority of Catholics uh, uh, did not support Italian entry into war. And the attitude of the church was very critical towards what Pope Benedict XV called in uh, 1915 an appalling butchery. Uh, and a couple of years later, a useless slaughter. So the papacy was particularly uh, aggrieved, of course, by the fratricidal nature of, uh, of the war in which many Catholics, uh, where millions of Catholics were <coughs> uh, in the Entente, uh, lived in the Entente powers, millions of Catholics lived in the central powers. It was uh, certainly not something that uh, the Pope approved of. Uh, yet, after Italy uh, entered the war, uh, is um, in an increasingly nationalistic climate, most Catholics rallied around the flag and strove to be recognized as good patriots. In 1915, for example, uh, the director of a journal, an educational journal called Scuola Cattolica, uh, rejected rejected what he called the mistrust against the patriotism of Catholics. The, uh, the patriotism, he claimed, uh, was a Benintezo uh, patriotism. It was a well-conceived patriotism. Uh, and did not contrast with the universality, with the universalism of Catholic, Catholicism, because he said races and nations were natural human groups that had to be uh, recognized. He even claimed that uh, a love of country uh, was a precept already present in Thomas Aquinas. So well-conceived patriotism was a very noble sentiment to be acted upon. Uh, it was not alone in thinking this way. Many members of the Italian clergy at all levels uh, uh, contributed actively uh, to the sacralization of the war. Uh, not only by <coughs> serving as uh, war chaplains uh, in the army, and this is a new institution uh, with, that I want to point out, uh, but also by fostering uh, the cult of the sacred heart of Christ. Uh, as Daniele Menozzi and others have pointed out uh, in, uh, in various studies, uh, this is a trend that was also seen across Europe. It's not, uh, it's not just Italian. Um, by imposing also, and also the Catholic contributed by, of course, imposing all sorts of uh, Christian meanings and, uh, and, and readings to this senseless slaughter that was going on, right? The idea of the sacrifice, uh, of course, is major. Uh, you know, it, it, was, uh, it was a trauma, it was a traumatic experience for many, and, and the Catholics were very active in providing, in providing some kind of sense. To this, uh, um, to this senseless uh, slaughter. Uh, more importantly, I would say that worried about uh, the secularization of Italian society, uh, and there were sort of, we, we do not have uh, major studies about that, but you know, if you just compare these figures uh, between the census, uh, we say within the census of 1900, the census of 1911, uh, we can see a slight increase in the number of those who uh, claimed that they didn't have a religion. Right, they go from uh, 0 0.1 percent to 2.5 or something like that. And so there is this kind of uh, uh, move that can be uh, seen also um, uh, at that level. Now, more, uh, so clergymen saw the war. Um, many clergymen saw the war as an opportunity to re-Christianize the uh, Italian society. The Franciscan uh, Agostino Gemelli, for example the future founder of the Catholic University of the Sacred Heart in Milan, who also contributed uh, to stirring anti-Semitic feelings in Italian society, was the most prominent of these uh, clergymen. He, he powerfully revived uh, the cult of the Sacred Heart, for example, along with a woman, uh, a Catholic activist by the name of uh, Armida Varelli. He wrote, uh, uh, the act of consecration to the sacred heart of Christ, which two million uh, Italian soldiers uh, were supposed to <coughs> recite on the first um, Friday of 1917. And let me just read you a brief passage from, uh, from this um, act of consecration. It reads, uh, 
how sacred heart we the soldiers of Italy recognize you as our God. We <coughs> proclaim you as our sovereign of love and we want to bring you glory. Illuminate, guide and lead us uh, to uh, lead to victory our king, our generals, all of us soldiers of Italy. Make our fatherland great and Christian. Bring us back to our families stronger and better. Reign over the whole nation and in our hearts. End of quotation. At the time, uh, Gemelli was a consultant to the general staff of the Italian army, uh, chosen uh, by the very head of the army, General Cadorna. Okay, so before this kind of figure had not existed, right? So this kind of convergence between <coughs> state, uh, liberal state, and the church happens right then at an institutional level at that point. <coughs> so, uh, so Cadorna was responsible for introducing this figure of the military chaplain. Moreover, Germany was also involved in the study at the time in the study of military psychology. Uh, the purpose of these studies, uh, which he published in 1917, uh, was quite practical, as he recognized. Uh, victory depended, he claimed, on a psychical element. Uh, and thus it was necessary to study the soul of the Italian soldier to mobilize them more effectively in the war effort. Uh, such a knowledge could uh, uh, then also be utilized in the same uh, and I'm quoting, the same national education of our the Italian people for the post-war. So there was something that could be utilized very, uh, very effectively also later. Uh, in the text, he uh, also, uh, it's quite, it's quite uh, I would say, an educational experience to read it. Uh, in the text, uh, he uh, works on um, about the, uh, I'm quoting here, the poetry of mass, of mass celebrating in the field, the comfort of churches full of people, the comfort of churches full of people, the comfort <laughs> that, of course, clergymen received. Um, and mentioned and mentions men who, having lived all their lives away from the religion, now for the first time familiarize themselves with the sacraments. We think about men, of course, women, maybe it's a different story if we think about um, attendance, church attendance by women and so on, but certainly many men have probably forgotten about that. So there's no doubt that the war made religion again. Um, and the Catholic religion that was there, <laughs> uh, again, more, uh, more than ever, uh, into a source of consolation and hope of uh, help for many ordinary men, and even women in Italy and elsewhere. Uh, the trenches, uh, those who have studied you know, uh, the trenches at the time, uh, the presence of religion there, the, 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 the trenches were full of all kinds of Christian symbols, uh, you know, not only cross, uh, 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 crucifixes, but of course nails uh, that uh, symbolize, uh, you know, the passion of Christ for which uh, soldiers also were, got, were going through in, in the eyes of those who tried to give meaning to the experience. Now, um, so soldiers trying, of course, trying to protect themselves, trying to use any kind of uh, instruments to find relief. After the end of the slaughter, uh, the many ceremonies organized to honor the fallen always feature Catholic priests offic officiating at masses. Uh, Catholics then organize their own, uh, um, their own commemorating ceremonies for what they call the Catholic martyrs uh, of the war. The soldiers who allegedly died kissing both the rosary and the flag. So the tricolor flag now became a feature of these celebrations. Uh, and so God, of course, the Catholic God uh, and country had finally been united. Thus the Great War uh, served as a crucial time uh, when church and state significantly strengthened a relationship with men, which many liberal Catholics uh, I'd always seen as indispensable and, and necessary, and that had primarily been obstructed by the intransigence of Pius IX. 
And <clears throat> but sec some sectors, of course, also are the hierarchy and the laity. Uh, again, let's not forget that since the research mentioned neo growths such as Vincenzo Gioberti and very Catholic, uh, uh, moderate liberals like Cesare Baldo, had developed an, a Catholic inflection of the idea of Italian identity in which the Roman Catholic Church uh, and the Catholic religion, religion feature prominently. In their views, Catholics uh, gave uh, uh, in, in uh, indelible imprint to Italian civilization. Uh, they were perhaps not so sure about the virtues of that Catholicism had instilled in ordinary Italians because at the time the idea of the good, good people was not so, uh, so strong in the research mentor. Uh, but later they would develop also that idea of Italians, especially after the war, after World War I. Right after the war, uh, the neo Wells discourse reappeared uh, in the language of the Partito Popolare, uh, for example, in the appeal to, uh, for the founding of the party in Germany 1919, uh, there were explicit references to some key words of, neo uh, of the neo Guelph program. So the great civilizing mission of Italy, for example, uh, and they adopted, of course, the, uh, the shield with the cross uh, as their symbol with the word libertas on it. Uh, a, symbol that, a symbolism that directly connected the present with the political and religious symbolism of the medieval communes. Uh, thanks to the war, religi religious feelings and patriotic feelings seem to be no longer in opposition. By its end, the rapprochement between so-called Italia legale and Italia reale, which uh, is a distinction, of course, that goes back to Catholic milieus right after the end of unification. Uh, this, this kind of distinction was in the eyes of many over. Uh, of course, it still, it still needed to resolve institutionally, legally, the, the Roman question. But uh, uh, Don Sturzo, to uh, name the founder of the um, popular party, uh, when he articulated uh, his program, he called it a truly Italian program. For, um, uh, and it used, uh, he used all the key words that, that were present in the national, nationalist discourse of the time. Uh, the references to the genius of the race, for example, uh, the cultural heritage of Rome, uh, Latin civilization, uh, the, religion, the religious and Catholic conscience of the Italian, uh, the Guelph history of Italy. So the spirit, if not, if not the letter of uh, uh, neo is defeated during the resurgiment was back with a vengeance uh, and was a ground for the convergence of conservative Catholics with fascism. So besides the common, so we've seen at this point that uh, um, Catholic uh, nationalists and even populari shared, shared the ground with fascism, uh, the myth of Rome's universal and civilizing mission. The um, <coughs> Uh, without the obstacle of the liberal stage soon eliminated by the fascists, that there was no longer any tension uh, between the religious identity of the majority of Italians and national patriotism. So, thanks to the uh, common cultural and not just political uh, terrain they shared with fascism, important Catholic uh, sectors of Italian public opinion welcomed the new movement and then they welcomed the regime. Uh, many perceived that uh, the secular and anti-clerical Italian state was on its way out and that the Catholic desire to hegemonize Italian society could finally become a reality. Even though it's true, many did not see, see it coming exactly when it did and so on. But the perception that way they were on the rebound, right, that they were actually you know, in, uh, in charge was there. Uh, and even before uh, the establishment of fascism as a regime, let's remember the founding of the Catholic University in Milan in 1921 was a step in the direction, in, in, in the eyes of these Catholics, in the right direction to properly form uh, a new Italian uh, ruling elite. So, um, moving, uh, and I want to conclude because we have a few more minutes, uh, three or four minutes. Um, I have been pointing out that although the church had never been out of the Italian public sphere, right, and it was even present in some Italian institutions in limited fashion, 
Uh, even at the times it was uh, of maximum complex, it was undoubtedly the war that allowed for this sort of massive re-entering of religion into uh, a major state institution, such uh, as the army. Uh, this re-entry was also favored by the programs of the Pope, who replaced um, Benedict XV in 1922, Pius XI. Pius XI began a crusade to re-Christianize modern society after the terrible turmoil of war and revolution. The project to realize this uh, uh, dominion of Christ, uh, real dominion of Christ uh, on earth, uh, was already outlined in the first papal encyclical of 1922, which instructed Catholics to create a totally Christian society. Uh, in this crusade, Italy had to play a central role, and the church uh, assumed so fascism as a possible ally. Fascism complied very quickly. Already in 1923, it brought back the crucifix uh, in all those public uh, places from uh, which uh, it had been removed. There were not many, but there were some, and it was, and the crucifix was back. Uh, in 1926, it reinstated the Catholic clergy within the army, because after the end of the war, it had been, uh, the, uh, the clergymen uh, went to, back to their parishes. Uh, 26, it becomes an institution. So, uh, and military chaplains were given the rank of officers uh, and an ample arena for exercising influence. So to conclude, um, we are used to thinking uh, about Italian society as eternally and eternally Catholic country. And undoubted, undoubtedly, Catholicism has been around for a long time. It has influenced habits and mentalities. However, we also need to remember that there is a history here too, and that Catholicism um, has known ups some ups and downs, at least at the elite level, uh, or even among ordinary Italians, uh, and especially after the creation of uh, the nation state, right, for a while. Uh, with all their limitations, the resurgement and the liberal state represented periods in which the Catholic hegemony was questioned and limited. But with the Great War, uh, things change uh, radically, and the church project to reimpose its hegemony, no longer found obstacles, especially after the rise of fascism. The political movement that we have already, you know, we all know, was started, however, by someone who was originally very strongly anti-clerical. So, thank you. Thank you very much. For this uh, very interesting introduction to the um, next sessions. As you know from our being titled, our um, question of the angle that we chose uh, for this conference is um, what uh, did uh, an agreement between a government and a church, um, the Catholic Church, do to uh, religious minorities? And uh, how were religious minority a measure to which extent that were they a measure of um, the ability the, the ability of a country to maintain and, and continue to implement its uh, liberal or um, democratic uh, tools. So that our next uh, um, presentation will be by Michele Salfatti, director of the Center for Contemporary Jewish Documentation in Milan, and uh, is in fact dedicated to the Falco Law and the Italian Jewish communities. The Falco Law was uh, um, the law that followed the latter impact to regulate uh, the uh, legal status of the uh, Jews, of the Jewish communities in Italy and uh, radically uh, changed their uh, situation, their conditions, um, as uh, it, it had the, 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 the condition that they are known uh, right after the unification of the country and their emancipation. Um, please welcome Michele Sarfatti. Uh, the presentation will be in Italian, and you will be able to follow it in English uh, on the screen. I will ask to perhaps lower a little bit the lights so that uh, um, the public will uh, be able to read to read better. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you to our hospital, La Casa d'Italia, 
Jerry uh, Limarimo, and thank you for the wonderful works, work made by Centro Primo Levi, Natalia Indrini, Alessandro Cassina. I'm very proud to be here. And uh, uh, yes, you are going to, to, to look at my, at my paper, and uh, after we will debate in English, perhaps. Uh, All'inizio del XX secolo, le comunità ebraiche in Italia erano totalmente autonome l'una dall'altra. La maggior parte si chiamava Università Israelitica, un piccolo numero Comunità Israelitica, e poi c'erano nomi diversi come Fraterna Generale di Culto e di Beneficenza in Venezia. Avevano differenti basi giuridiche e differenti impostazioni statutarie. A Roma e Milano erano libere associazioni, in Piemonte e successivamente in altre città erano regolate dalla legge Rattazzi, emanata nel 1857 dal Regno di Sardegna, eh, nelle città che erano state parte dell'impero austro-ungarico, Venezia e poi dopo la guerra, Trieste, eccetera, si continuava ad applicare la normativa eh, austro-ungarica. Ciò comportava differenze molto eh, rilevanti, eh, per esempio in alcune città, in Piemonte e nell'ex Austria, gli ebrei residenti avevano l'obbligo di iscriversi e l'obbligo di pagare un contributo economico, in altre no e fra queste ultime c'erano Roma e Milano che erano eh, oramai negli anni 20 quelle con la maggior popolazione mh, ebraica, oltre un terzo degli ebrei italiani. Anche la cessazione dell'iscrizione a una comunità talora doveva avvenire con una formale dichiarazione di avviura o di conversione e, e quindi corrispondeva a un distacco definitivo dall'ebraismo, talora costituiva un atto più semplice che poteva essere anche eh, temporaneo e cambiato. Change. Eh, le comunità ebraiche italiane conciliavano la fedeltà alla tradizione religiosa e culturale millenaria con l'apertura alle innovazioni che caratterizzavano la società complessiva. Ad esempio, per quello che riguarda la questione dell'elettorato passivo delle donne, cioè del diritto delle donne, della possibilità per le donne ebree di essere elette nei consigli, nei board, si può ricordare che a Firenze un referendum apposito nella comunità del 1911 fu vinto dagli emancipazionisti ma poi venne invalidato a causa dell'alto numero di astensioni e schede bianche. Fino a quando a Venezia nel 1920 la signora Emma Cavalieri Padova fu eletta consigliere e membro del board e eh, Angelo Sullan commentò è la prima volta che nei consessi, nei consigli amministrativi ebraici d'Italia è chiamata una donna. Questo per dare un esempio del movimento che era in corso. Nel 1909 quasi tutte le comunità italiane si riunirono in un congresso. In quelli seguenti del 1911 e del 1914 furono costituiti un comitato delle università israelitiche italiane, che era il primo ente nazionale di collegamento fra le comunità, eh, e un ente che era stato chiamato Consorzio delle Università o Comunità Israelitiche Italiane. Il consorzio era basato sull'adesione volontaria delle comunità, era posto sotto la direzione del comitato, aveva il compito di occuparsi degli enti ebraici che a causa della migrazione degli ebrei dalle piccole località nei maggiori centri, eh, questi enti vivevano o la stagione finale della propria vita o la stagione iniziale della propria vita, nonché di tutto ciò che era di comune interesse nei campi della cultura ebraica e dei beni storici artisti. Nel 1920 il consorzio fu eretto in ente morale, ossia ricevette la personalità giuridica. In tale occasione venne aggiornato il suo statuto che ora menzionava anche il fine della tutela dell'interesse generale dell'ebraismo. 
eh, è importante questa parola eh, generale perché nell'Italia cattolica la possibilità, ma anche in tutta l'Europa cristiana, la questione che gli ebrei avessero un interesse generale di per sé si poneva, permassero di avere, si poneva in conflitto con eh, i nazionalismi, eh, con le identità nazionali, i nazionalismi nascenti. Pensate che destò un grande scandalo e ebbe una fortissima eco negativa la costituzione in Francia, in France, dell'Alliance Israelite Universelle, because of the word universal in, his, uh, in, her, in its denomination. Eh, dal marzo 1921 il comitato ebbe come presidente Angelo Sereni, che era anche presidente della comunità di Roma, e come vicepresidenti Felice Ravenna e Angelo Sullam. Eh, tra le sue iniziative, tra le molte sue iniziative, va ricordata la Costituzione nel gennaio 1921 del Comitato Italiano di Assistenza agli Emigranti Ebrei, Emigranti dello suo massimo ah, sì, scritto in inglese, primo moderno <ride> organismo di tale genere a dimensione nazionale. Lo Statuto del Regno di Sardegna, eh, es patriarca Torribo, rimasto in vigore dopo l'unità, stabiliva all'articolo 1 che la religione cattolica apostolica romana è la sola religione dello Stato gli altri culti ora esistenti sono tollerati conformemente alle leggi. Esso quindi affermava il principio della tolleranza e non quello della par parità, anche se allora il vocabolo tolleranza, almost in Italian language, aveva un significato diverso e maggiormente positivo di quello che ha oggi. Eh, successivamente, qui ne ha parlato nuovo patriarca con lo sviluppo del codice penale del 1889 e la unica formula culti ammessi nello Stato. Invece già nel discorso di presentazione alla Camera del suo primo governo il 16 novembre 1922 Benito Mussolini affermò che tutte le fedi religiose saranno rispettate con particolare riguardo a quella dominante che è il cattolicismo. L'aggettivo dominante aveva un preciso significato di diseguaglianza e di gerarchia e non a caso il giorno seguente il quotidiano vaticano osservatore romano scrisse il cattolicismo da religione uguale alle varie confessioni professate da insignificanti, insignificanti minoranze si fa religione dominante dello Stato. Dopo l'unione all'Italia delle regioni nord-orientali comprendenti le comunità di Trieste, Fiume e altre minori, eh, alla fine degli anni venti gli ebrei italiani o stranieri residenti stabilmente, eh, stranieri con residenza stabile, erano circa 44.000, ossia l'uno per mille della popolazione complessiva pressoché tutti abitavano nella metà d'Italia compresa tra le Alpi e le città di Roma e Ancona. L'impostazione religiosa delle comunità si manteneva distante sia dalle profonde innovazioni dei riformati come in Ungheria, in Germania e poi qui in, negli United States, sia dalla rigida conservazione degli ortodossi. Solo nella città ex ungherese di fiume Rieca, per via della sua particolare storia, vi era anche una unione israelitica ortodossa, parzialmente autonoma dalla comunità ufficiale italiana. Eh, riguardo ai flussi migratori, va ricordato che l'Italia era caratterizzata da molti, il paese Italia, da molte zone di povertà e da una consistente emigrazione di italiani cattolici, popolazione normale, per cui non costituiva un'attrattiva per i molti centinaia di migliaia di ebrei che venivano via dall'Europa orientale e che si dirigevano verso la Francia, la Germania, l'Inghilterra e di nuovo gli United States, Australia, Canada, eccetera. Eh, prima degli anni 30 del Novecento i pochi spostamenti di ebrei avvenivano soprattutto lungo un'asse eh, unicamente sefardita 
Italia, Grecia, Turchia in entrambi i sensi. Eh, gli ebrei italiani erano fortemente integrati nella nazione post-risorgimentale laica o qualche volta anticlericale o mangia preti e eh, come si dice mangia preti e, e qualche volta anche rabbi eater in questo uh, <ride> In questa, uh, ma sono accadute cose in Italia che erano uh, l'espressione italiana fuori dal mondo out of, the, out of this world uh, pensate che uh, appunto Ernesto Nathan ebreo e massone fu sindaco di Roma nel 1907 e 1913 e fu il primo sindaco non aristocratico di Roma mentre Luigi Luzzatti fu presidente del Consiglio dei Ministri nel 1910-1911 e in Dossia eh, Ottolenghi e Giuvos, Minister of War, il ministero più sacro delle nazioni fra eh, 800 e 900. Tutto questo mentre a Vienna c'era eh, Borgomastro, cioè sindaco, eh, l'antisemita Karl Lüger, la Francia era lacerata ancora dalla Dreyfus in Russia si succedevano i pogrom, in Romania continuavano le interdizioni anti-ebraiche. La Romania era divenuta stato, sempre sono molto d'accordo, I agree a lot with the Svana Patriarca, la Romania era diventata stato intorno alla religione largamente maggioritaria, l'Italia era diventata stato contro gli interessi eh, politici, economici, geopolitici della religione who was the, the religion of 99.9% of the population it's a very original um, path in, 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 in Europe anche in Italia vi erano in quell'epoca fermenti antisemiti e episodi di ostilità di varia origine politica e culturale ma in genere non erano caratterizzati da partecipazione di massa né da eh, avalli governativi né da violenze fisiche ehm, in alcune città del Mediterraneo mediter me me africano e asiatico risiedevano collettività di ebrei italiani una parte dei quali aveva una posizione sociale predominante sia rispetto agli altri italiani sia rispetto agli altri ebrei locali ce n'erano varie migliaia e discendevano una storia molto complicata che discende dalle leggi eh, livornine varate dal granducato dei medici per eh, attrarre gli ebrei che eh, erano espulsi dalla Spagna in la long history ma loro avevano il passaporto e la cittadinanza eh, italiana erano varie migliaia a Tunisi e Alessandra d'Egitto numerose centinaia a Istanbul, Salonicco e altre località a Smirne, Siria, Bulgaria, eccetera. Beh, è interessante che i governi italiani tennero conto solo limitatamente di questa presenza e non la inglobarono organicamente nella propria politica espansionistica mediterranea. L'Italia perse un treno, si dice in, in italiano, eh, nel momento in cui la Francia sosteneva l'espansione delle scuole dell'Alliance Israelite Universelle e l'Inghilterra nel tavolo di gioco del, del, dell'ebraismo mediterraneo eh, giocava la carta del sostegno al sionismo e l'Italia che avrebbe avuto maggiori possibilità rimase l'Italia come Stato imperiale eh, il 31 ottobre 1922 venne costituito il primo governo d'Italia a guida fascista, di esso non facevano parte né ebrei né propagandisti antisemiti. Inoltre né il suo programma né lo statuto contenevano affermazioni antisemite. Comunque, come ha dimostrato nei suoi lavori eh, Giorgio Fabre il, il nuovo leader Benito Mussolini possedeva evidenti convinzioni o pregiudizi anti-ebraici 
e i più attivi propagandisti antisemiti aderirono, si iscrissero al partito. Peraltro ci furono anche ebrei che abbracciarono il fascismo e appoggiarono la costruzione della dittatura. Di nuovo un caso completamente unico in, in, in Europa e fuori d'Italia noi we, we do not have a, a, a very strong comparative historiography. Uh, ma invece se la, la comparazione è importantissima e essenziale per capire meglio l'Italia e per capire meglio uh, to better comprehend the Germany or Hungary or I don't know or the British Mosley o tutti, eh, tutti gli altri eh, Mussolini iniziò subito a demolire il regime democratico liberale e quello che qui interessa è che sin dall'inizio del ventennio fascista alcuni avvenimenti, alcune leggi resero evidente che era in corso un mutamento something was changing nella condizione degli ebrei anche se nessun provvedimento di legge riguardava esplicita, espressamente gli ebrei va tuttavia considerato che in quegli anni pressoché tutte le altre articolazioni della società nazionale furono oggetto di decreti autoritari o, o liberticidi o di processi di fascistizzazione. Così è molto difficile riuscire a comprendere, a isolare la condizione degli ebrei. Per quanto riguarda queste nuove norme generali, si possono ricordare la legge sul controllo governativo della stampa del luglio eh, 23 che stabilì sanzioni speciali solo per il vilipendio della religione dello Stato. La riforma dell'istruzione elementare dell'ottobre 1923, che prescrisse che l'istruzione aveva come fondamento e coronamento l'insegnamento del cattolicesimo. Il nuovo codice penale che è stato studiato da Ilaria Pavan, che parlerà dopo, che il cui progetto preliminare era stato reso noto nel 1927, che introdusse una tutela giuridica differenziata per il cattolicesimo e per le altre fedi. Va poi tenuto presente che la riforma dei comuni del 1926, introducendo il potestà di nomina regia e sopprimendo il principio elettivo dei sindaci, abrogò la fonte giuridica della normativa elettorale per i consigli degli enti ebraici che era contenuta nella legge Rattazzi quindi questa legge non aveva più un fondamento e poi nel novembre 1925 venne emanata una legge che assoggettava le associazioni di qualsiasi tipo al controllo di polizia e vietava in particolare ai dipendenti pubblici di appartenere a società segrete legge che era rivolta in particolare contro quella massoneria che i pubblicisti antisemiti affiancavano regolarmente al giudaismo. Per quanto concerne gli atti antisemiti, il più grave fu la devastazione della sinagoga di Padova, il 1 novembre 1926, fatta da fascisti per protestare contro un attentato subito da Mussolini. Eh, in tale occasione, proprio in Veneto, in quella regione, furono attaccate anche sedi di associazioni cattoliche, ma l'attacco all'edificio religioso ebraico aveva una particolare gravità. Tutta questa situazione era resa più complessa dall'azione intrapresa dagli ebrei fascisti per conquistare i consigli delle comunità. Essi ottennero il loro primo successo a Firenze, vincendo le elezioni nel novembre 1926. Tutti questi elementi furono all'origine nel gennaio 27 dell'avvio della progettazione da parte ebraica di una nuova legge regolamentatrice delle comunità e del loro ente nazionale. Nel 1926 il Comitato aveva chiesto al governo se il governo aveva, aveva qualche intenzione al riguardo e il governo aveva risposto negativamente che tutto rimaneva valido come era. Tuttavia è indubbio che la richiesta ebraica fu una presa d'atto 
e una risposta obbligata ai processi di fascistizzazione, cattolicizzazione e differenziazione che erano in corso nello Stato e nella società. Uh, dal mio punto di vista, uh, it's very important to understand that it was a, 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 a volunteer path, un passo volontario o no. Yes, it was volontario, but it was obliged by the whole situation. Um, salto un pezzo perché sennò è troppo, uh, um, è troppo lungo e non c'è tempo. Uh, Riprendo, da, eh, riprendo dal, dal dibattito interno alle, alle, alle comunità e, e agli ebrei. Eh, no, ma eh, some of the Jews wanted, eh, alcuni volevano, eh, some wanted to strengthen, ok, alcuni volevano un rafforzamento del comitato a detrimento dell'autonomia delle comunità le quali invece difendevano fortemente la propria indipendenza eh, il nuovo clima fascista nella società rafforzava le richieste di alcuni di estendere in tutta Italia anche a Roma e Milano l'obbligatorietà dell'iscrizione degli ebrei lì residenti talora senza nemmeno chiedere il consenso di questi ebrei che abitavano lì eh, i più, gli ebrei più fascisti volevano un adeguamento di tutta la normativa ebraica a quella non più democratica dello Stato fascista. Gli ebrei sionisti o, e o, and, o antifascisti o other Jews difendevano il sistema delle libere elezioni. Poi vi era chi voleva un consorzio, un comitato con maggiore autorità per essere conforme ai nuovi principi fascisti e chi voleva un comitato un consorzio con maggiore autorità per poter meglio rappresentare gli interessi dell'ebreismo nei confronti del governo. Vi era chi voleva che l'ente ebraico nazionale non avesse rapporti con le altre collettività ebraiche, a partire dalle organizzazioni internazionali sioniste, per adeguarsi al nazionalismo fascista e chi voleva che invece il comitato svolgesse un ruolo di ponte con l'ebraismo sefardita e anche col sionismo nel Mediterraneo per risultare utile alla politica estera imperiale del fascismo. Nel febbraio 1927 il comitato nominò una commissione di studio composta da tre ebrei questo comitato eh, eh, esaminò lo schema, de, de, la, commissione fece, riassumo, la commissione fece una proposta di eh, nuova legge, il comitato la ricevette, la esaminò, la trattenne eh, alcuni mesi, eh, nel frattempo Mussolini aveva scritto nell'agosto 1927 eh, aveva scritto su un appunto interno al governo che le richieste di riforma portate lì dal rabbino capo di Roma, Angelo Sacerdoti, erano tali da suscitare malumori nella Chiesa Cattolica. Eh, lo schema eh, di legge preparato dalla Commissione ebraica prevedeva fra l'altro eh, l'adozione della denominazione comunità e per tutti gli enti e un regolamento bylaws uguale per tutti gli enti. Il riconoscimento delle comunità come persone giuridiche di diritto pubblico e fornite di potere di imposizione. Eh, L'appartenenza obbligatoria di ciascun ebreo alla comunità territorialmente competente a meno di un suo abbandono formale della religione. Il sistema elettivo interno per il Consiglio di amministrazione e per la nomina del Presidente del Consiglio, la necessità del possesso della cittadinanza italiana per il Presidente, per almeno due terzi dei consiglieri e per i rabbini e per i segretari della comunità. Non era, it was not, uh, uh, non era previsto per tornare alla relazione di uh, Margiotta Voglio letta da Albertini ieri, nessun tipo di giuramento eh, si vede 
anche in questo si, we can see the difference between the treatment of the uh, Catholicism and the other, and the other uh, religion. Um, tutte le comunità dovevano essere eh, inquadrate in una federazione delle, delle comunità con un consiglio composto solo da italiani, doveva essere creato il Gran Rabbino d'Italia, um, fortunatamente non è stato fatto e poi alla fine ha vinto, però questo Gran Rabbino d'Italia, l'idea del Gran Rabbino d'Italia discendeva dalla eh, politica esterna al, 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 al discorso lungo. Eh, il, il punto 8, 8 è molto complicato perché riguarda i compiti eh, del rabbino e del presidente laico della comunità. Eh, eh, 9, 9, la necessità della, di una convalida del, eh, governativa all'elezione dei presidenti della federazione delle comunità e dei rabbini capo, non un giuramento ma un esame di loro stesso. Eh, vado uh, il 22 marzo 1929, il, eh, il ministro Alfredo Rocco nominò una commissione per esaminare questo uh, progetto e questa richiesta delle comunità. Va ricordato che il 29 novembre 1928, cioè quattro giorni dopo che il Consorzio delle Comunità aveva consegnato al, al, al governo il progetto, la richiesta di riforma legislativa, Mussolini pubblicò un articolo anonimo ma riconducibile a lui, a, non, non, ho, non da noi storici oggi ma dagli italiani di, di, di quell'epoca, che polemizzava con gli ebrei italiani sionisti e chiedeva a tutti essi siete una religione o siete una nazione? Dopo aver ricevuto e pubblicato varie risposte ebraiche, sullo stesso giornale il dittatore replicò con un nuovo articolo anonimo il 15 dicembre affermando di aver voluto provocare una chiarificazione su un problema che esiste dove le parole importanti sono the problem does exist non, non, eh. Eh, a mio parere lo scopo di Mussolini era di avvertire i dirigenti dell'ebraismo che l'avvio governativo del processo di riforma doveva essere accompagnato da parte ebraica da un maggior adeguamento al nuovo clima fascista sia relativamente alla specifica militanza sionista in Italia sia relativamente alla più generale libertà di opinione e di dibattito interna alle comunità ebraiche. Da un punto di vista cronologico si può inoltre notare che la data della nomina della commissione paritetica era successiva di oltre un mese alla data della stipula del trattato dei patti lateranensi, anche also from a chronological point of uh, government there is a, a chronology to, to the priority to, to be respected by Mussolini. Uh, nel, uh, lasciamo perdere questo, uh, perché non ho tempo. Infine um, la normativa elaborata dalla commissione paritetica tre ebrei e tre rappresentanti del governo venne varata con due decreti del ottobre 1930 e del novembre 1931. Questi decreti modificarono nel seguente modo le richieste che avevano elaborato nel 1927 la commissione ebraica che era guidata dal professor Mario Profalco. Eh, al punto 3 la revoca dell'iscrizione a una comunità venne consentita anche a, chi, anche a chi avesse dichiarato di non voler più essere considerato israelita agli effetti del presente decreto, che era una norma un po' maggiormente laica rispetto alla richiesta eh, iniziale ebraica. Il possesso della cittadinanza italiana da parte di Rabbini Capo venne indicato come preferibile. L'ente centrale venne denominato Unione e non Federazione, 
non venne messo il Gran Rabbino d'Italia, ma venne istituita una consulta rabbinica, l'ambito di competenza del Rabbino Capo venne complessivamente definito direzione spirituale della comunità, la gestione amministrativa è nostra, dei, del board, del presidente, dei consiglieri laici, eh, venne confermata la convalida ministeriale delle nomine dei rabbini capo venne, e dei presidenti di comunità, venne inserito per desiderio, per volontà del governo il fatto che l'elettorato passivo era riservato ai soli maschi e non più anche alle donne, come era la proposta. Eh, vado avanti, scusate, e mi eh, coordino con, eh, con lui per arrivare ai punti fi finali. Eh, con la legge Fallico, così essa fu chiamata, eh, da... da da no. uh, with the Falco Law uh, l'ebraismo italiano acquisì un riconoscimento e uno strumento assai rilevanti da un lato la legge significava automaticamente una tranquillizzante dichiarazione ufficiale di diritto all'esistenza per gli ebrei nel regime fascista così venne interpretata Dall'altro la quasi obbligatorietà dell'iscrizione alle comunità consentiva di arginare gli effetti del processo di secolarizzazione, di uscita dalle comunità ebraiche, di laicizzazione e di rafforzare grazie ai contributi connessi le amministrazioni comunitarie. Tutto ciò era consolidato dalla creazione di un ente centrale e dall'obbligatorietà dell'adesione ad esso delle singole comunità. Il mantenimento, anche se molto limitato, del sistema elettivo costituiva poi un ulteriore elemento positivo, in parte insperato. In cambio di ciò le comunità dovettero abbandonare le proprie specifiche secolari caratterizzazioni, vennero sottoposte a numerosi controlli politici persero in sostanza la propria autonomia, divennero per certi aspetti, assieme all'Unione, organi delle comunità, organi dello Stato e non più esclusiva espressione del libero volere e del libero essere delle eh, collettività, eh, delle singole, di, di loro stessi, degli ebrei. Alcune di queste rinunce erano esplicitate nella stessa relazione di accompagnamento allo schema di legge elaborato dalla Commissione del Consorzio nel 1927. Eh, sono parole che sembrano soft, ma sono scritte per tener conto del clima autoritario e fascistico eh, in acto, existent at that moment. Delle nuove correnti del diritto pubblico italiano si è tenuto conto sia nel richiedere la cittadinanza italiana per coprire uffici nelle istituzioni israelitiche, sia nel richiedere l'approvazione statuale alle elezioni, sia nel sopprimere vasti corpi deliberativi, sia nel togliere ai membri, agli iscritti delle comunità, l'elezione dei rabbini, sia nell'accrescere dovunque i poteri degli organi esecutivi a danno, diminuendo quelli degli organi eh, deliberativi. Salto ancora eh, eh, due cose, non disponiamo ancora, ok, go down, there is not, ok, non disponiamo ancora, due minuti ho finito, e non disponiamo ancora di ricerche storiche sullo spirito e sulle intenzioni con cui il governo fascista avviò e concluse l'iniziativa legislativa. Non c'è ricerca, there's not historical research on the uh, state paper. Comunque è certo che la riforma infine varata era, e non poteva non essere, centralizzatrice, autoritaria, irregimentatrice e tale da sollecitare il definitivo e autonomo avvio da parte ebraica della propria fascistizzazione. Eh, qui vi cito dei brani che sono già stati tradotti in inglese in un altro libro, quindi li cito in inglese, 
la relazione governativa sullo schema di decreto affermava che esso era consono with modern public law which provides that all forms of activities especially those that are of collective nature are subject to the authority and strict supervision of the state e questa stessa relazione eh, governativa così man, eh, motivava il mantenimento del sistema elettorale it was decided not to completely abandon that system since the activity of community representatives mainly lies in the administration of contributions a task with no political implication we can think that uh, reducing the Jews to a financial or economical uh, association there is a, a, a some kind of anti-Semite <coughs> implication in this, but è, è un altro discorso. Occorre inoltre tenere presente che con i patti lateranensi e la legge Falco e nel 1929-1931 il fascismo realizzò una politica di diverso trattamento dei vari culti adottando un regime concordatario per quello cattolico scritto ieri da, nel paper di Maggiore de Broglio e tornando al giuris, giurisdizionalismo per, eh, per gli altri. Uh, I think that my half of hour is, is passed. Uh, 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 Concludo, concludo ma ho perso due pezzi. Ecco. La legittimità data alla nuova legge, dalla nuova legge ai contatti spirituali e culturali dell'Unione con le altre collettività ebraiche, e in particolare con quelle tradizionalmente legate all'Italia, costituiva non tanto un riferimento al progetto del rabbino capo di Roma, sacerdoti, che era richiamato nella relazione governativa, quanto piuttosto la definizione dei limiti operativi imposti all'Unione stessa. L'addizione utilizzata infatti escludeva sia lo stabilimento di rapporti più o meno organici con le altre comunità ebraiche, sia l'azione comune in ambito amministrativo o qualificabile come politico, compreso l'ambito della nazionalità ebraica, sia che fosse intesa in senso religioso, sia che fosse intesa in senso sionista. Un esame accurato della legge, dei suoi preparativi e delle sue conseguenze, dando attenzione ai suoi aspetti storici, giuridici e religiosi, richiederebbe una trattazione troppo estesa per qua. In questa sede, quale sintetica conclusion, sembra possibile affermare che la legge Falco fu richiesta dall'ebraismo, ma che questa richiesta non fu autonoma ma provocata dalla politica del fascismo che la legge era adeguata alle, alle necessità della dirigenza ebraica e la dirigenza ebraica la interpretò come garanzia o come speranza di un buon rapporto col governo dittatoriale la stessa legge era abbastanza adeguata ai principi che il governo fascista stava introducendo in tutta la nazione inoltre esso poté mostrare di essere si importa poter mostrare di essere in grado di dialogare con altre religioni oltre a quella cattolica e my last uh, statement uh, può essere uh, uh, occasione di uh, debate we, we do not have a, uh, a great debate on this in Italy we can have it here now in New York in my opinion uh, la legge Falco non è per riflessi sullo sviluppo dell'antisemitismo fascista che proseguì la sua strada autonoma e sfociò nel 1938 in una dura harsh legislazione persecutoria. Thank you for your
Many thanks to Michele Sarfati. We continue uh, the morning session with uh, Giorgio Fabre, independent scholar who is the author of uh, two books, uh, The List and The Contract, um, one of which has been translated into, into English. And his uh, presentation is entitled The Path from the Conciliation to the Agreement of August 1938. So exactly where, with the question uh, with which Michele Sarfatti left us, um, Giorgio Fabre will continue. Please uh, welcome Giorgio Fabre. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I decided to change my relation. I'm uh, hearing uh, uh, Michele's uh, uh, relation, and I decided uh, to uh, begin from a document uh, that uh, I, I didn't think to, to show you. It is a printed. It is published in this uh, Archivio della Nunziatura Apostolica Italiana, that is uh, the inventory of uh, uh, the archive of Nunziatura Apostolica Italiana in uh, the, the, the secret uh, archive in the Vatican. And I will show you a page of this uh, inventory. Uh, it, it, it is uh, interesting. Uh, you have to take it in mind uh, when I will read my paper uh, after this. This is the page. So you can see, I will translate, uh, quote, audience of 23 July 1932. Memos by Bolconcini Duca, that was the denuncio. Denuncio notes, ore 8 e mezza a.m. Il duce mi riceve minuto preciso, questo forse non è bisogno, non ci bisogna tradurlo. Thank 
chief of the regional education agency tried to help him, and it was untrue because it was not him that helped. Uh, we have uh, the papers to say that helped uh, Mario and maintained his him in place. Uh, finally, in uh, 1932. In September, uh, the government succeed after uh, these uh, uh, letters and uh, meetings uh, with the Duce, who said this, these things, look at this, uh, succeeded in uh, get off uh, Mario from uh, his place of work. There is a terrible, very, really terrible letter of Mario himself. <coughs> Vatican Archives, who uh, wrote to Virginia Duca and asked for uh, pity, for pity, this is uh, because he lost his, uh, his work and his, uh, his salary. Salary, yes, right. Uh, and uh, he had the family too. Uh, uh, but uh, uh, the Borgogini uh, Duca uh, replied that, that uh, he had to, um, to think of this before. And the terrible thing uh -huh. that there is uh, uh, in, in a little memo, a pencil uh, on the top of the document, uh, the Pope has seen, and the, has, uh, uh, seen it uh, gone. Well, this is finished, but you have to, to take in mind this, uh, this particular. I began this uh, relation, I'm sorry for this, but it's very interesting and uh, to be. Well, anyway, I, I began. In May 1945, Mussolini, escaping into Switzerland, carried with him a great deal of documents inside a couple of su suitcases, as known, as very known, later called the suitcase papers, the Carta della Valigia in Italy. In Italy. While more were sent on ahead, on in, in a truck. And, the, and those are the, the Carta del Camionci. Among these papers was a document which is the subject of this paper. It's very famous. Nobody knows for sure. I, I think that yesterday was uh, nominee uh, twice uh, this, <coughs> this document. Nobody knows for sure why he was taking this particular document with him. But hopefully, hopefully we may get a good idea by the end of the paper. The document I'd like to examine here is a report addressed to the king containing a summary account on the talks between Mussolini and Pope Pius XI at a meeting held on 11 February 1932. The papers Mussolini was carrying with him to Switzerland also included King Victor, Vittorio Emanuele's reply and his thanks for the interesting so, as is written, interesting account. Undoubtedly, the most significant passage of the entire document is the following. Pius XI said, quotation, I have received this very day the 35th, it's not clear, or uh, 36th, uh, is not clear, uh, volume of the Russian anti-religious library. There is also the underlying anti-Christian adversion. There is also there uh, in this book uh, adversion of Judaism. When I was in Warsaw, this is uh, Pius XI speaking. I saw that in all the Bolshevik regiments. The civil commissioners, whether male or female, the commissario or la commissaria, were invariably Jewish, 
In Italy, however, Jews represent an exception. At what time I was friendly with old Massarani, I, I mean, uh, it is always uh, the Pope who is speaking, who was the master of Balsamo Monzese, who is a town in Lombardia, region, and who endowed the church of the town with a wave of the cross. Also with Elialates, another and I was also a student of the rabbi of Milan, da Fano, when I wished to penetrate certain nuances of the Hebrew language. In the first part of the passage, Pius XI told Mussolini that uh, Bolshevism was influenced by Judaism, and therefore was anti-Christian. In the second part, however, he distinguished between Jews in general, and the Italian Jews. However, Pius XI said, in Italy, the Jews represent an exception. Jesuit, uh, some 
book, many books about this, uh, one wonderful by Hubert Wolf and so on. In fact, the Jesuit journal, uh, Civita Cattolica, condemned the Holy Office decree to reviving the half-baked Jewish plot theory with razor face in the talks between the Mussolini and, uh, and the Pope and blaming the Jews for the Russian Revolution as well. I mean, this in 1928. But uh, the most important aspect to be noted is that 10 years on, Pius XI vindicated his deci decision of uh, 1928 uh, when the fascist Russian campaign was in full swing. On 8 August 1938, the Jesuit who acted as the intermediary between Mussolini and the Pope, that is, uh, Father Taki Venturi, after having consulted with uh, Pius XI and with Pacelli, and this is important, uh, read and delivered to Mussolini a note attribute, attributed uh, to the Pope himself, uh, proudly reaffirming that uh, the moving reaffirmed, so this is 1938, the moving liturgy of Holy Friday, the Jews were defined as perfect. The same note also justified the use in the past Gettos, regarding which it said the Pope's quotation, quote, Mary desired to take provisions against the, the evil doings, the evil doings, that is, uh, in Italian, malefatte, by segregating them from the Christian subjects. Finish of the quotation. Uh, over the years, uh, other archive documents along the same lines, uh, and this uh, Emerged today, for example, we know the memo. We know of the memo from Taki Venturi to Mussolini, dated 28 October 1924. Uh, October 1924, approved. And this is important again, personally by the Pope on the subject because it is written on the, on the paper on the subject of the current anti-religious campaign in Italy and means to oppose it. It also denounced the multiform sectarianism of Jews, Protestants, Freemasons, and Bolsheviks altogether, constantly and powerfully allied against religion, against the church, and against the country's government. 1924. October, after the uh, Matteo. Clearly, the underlying idea was of a global plot orchestrated <coughs> by Jews, Protestants, Freemasons, and Bolsheviks. And it is interesting because there is a division in this document between Jews and Bolsheviks. Once again, we find the same themes and language on the talks held in 1932, which had focused on the church conviction that it was under attack, expressing a slightly claustrophobic view, lashing out and seeking help from the head of modern state. This is my interpretation of this document. A church under attack. And it, it is interesting, eh? What uh, we uh, what was said yesterday that there were sixteen components, but my opinion and uh, is that uh, these sixteen components, so a very large number in so many so few years, uh, it was a sign uh, of uh, of this uh, attack of this of, of this. Perceiving. Yes, or the perceiving of, of, of the, the church, church. See, that he, he was under attack. The attack was especially in two uh, very Catholic uh, countries, uh, that is uh, Mexico and Spain, and what is uh, for for from many years, for many years, uh, so the, the the church was thinking about. Um, 
and especially uh, the Pope uh, will repeat uh, this concept uh, with Mussolini, and especially from 1930, 1931, when in Spain and Mexico, there are many studies very interesting about this. I, uh, one of the, of the students of Professor Broglie, very, very interesting, uh, on uh, 1931 uh, in Mexico, um, the, the, the things change against the church. Uh, here there is a problem. So, the Pope very weak, on, who felt himself very weak. We must ask ourselves if the Pope was acquainted with the protocols of the Elder of Zion, and he considered them authentic. His belief in the conspiracy, in my opinion, was so obsessive that in all likelihood it was inspired by or based on precisely, precisely this, you know, famous document. Chaim Weizmann claims in his memoir that he had seen a copy of the protocols at the beginning of 1918. Rat himself could have learned about them while in Poland as nuncio, but he could have known the protocols through the Catholic Catholic interpretation given by the, the Città Cattolica in some famous articles in 1921 and 1922. But let's examine. But let's examine what actually occurred during the meeting on February 1932. The first, who was the first and only time Pius XI uh, uh, and Mussolini as Prime Minister, there was another meeting before, but as Prime Minister, actually met vis-a-vis. -vis. The only truly direct talks addressing the relation of state and church during the fascist period. This was as mentioned above, the only account that has come down to us was written by Mussolini himself for the king. Nobody else, as far as we know, was made private to it. Nor do we know of the existence of any reports or accounts on the talks, nor to uh, from the Vatican perspective. We may therefore assume that uh, uh, official account. I mean, uh, we may therefore assume that in that form it was meant to remain confidential between the Jews and the king. The meeting followed a serious, serious clash several months earlier between the fascist regime and the church regarding the Catholic action, where, but. Someone talked about this uh, yesterday, yesterday evening. Um, the talks on 11 February 1932 were held in the Pope's private library, and the venue itself was a certain had had a certain relevance. They lasted one hour and five minutes, according to a, a report published by the Observatory Romano newspaper, precisely from 10.45 uh, to 11.50, uh, immediately after Mussolini met uh, with uh, the Secretary of State, Camilla Pacelli, in his private apartment at uh, the Secretariat, Secretariat of State, Secretariat of State, the same afternoon, it was the protocol, uh, Cardinal Pacelli returned the visit, the same, uh, at Palazzo Venezia. The request for a meeting had come from the Pope, and I repeat the content of a, a very uh, weak Pope, of a Pope who uh, perceived himself as weak, uh, who in, a, in the account for the talk, of the talks comes to as the weaker party. 
Mussolini ha had refused to meet him for years, and just a few days before the date of the meeting, the Vatican authorities still feared that he would not keep his word. We, nothing, we know nothing about how Mussolini prepared for the meeting. Basically, his main concern was to show all and sundry that he was in an excellent relation with the papacy at the, at the, at the time, when he building up, uh, he, uh, I mean Mussolini, his credential as a reliable negotiator between the European powers. He appears to have been less interested in the domestic impact of the meeting, probably because at the time he had the country firmly under his control. However, there was one matter concerning which, yesterday too, which he prepared for the meeting in advance, the Protestant issue, which was significant because the Protestant churches were under the protection of the United States, and you remember Professor Kelser talked about uh, the, the report by the, the Embassy of USA in Rome, um, and Great Britain. The issue was related to the Concordat, and especially the approval of the law concerning the, the so-called uh, allowed cults, the Curtia Messi, in June 1929, uh, in connection with the set of laws implementing the Concordat. In what appears to be more than just coincidence, it is impossible that it is a consequence in, in a state like the fascist one. On the morning of uh, 11 February, the day fixed for the talks. The Italian newspapers ran articles on 1931 census figures relating to religion, exactly the same day in the morning, which had been published by the Institute of Statistics. In Italy, it emerged 3.9 people where every thousand had not been but into the Catholic Church, so 3.9. And every thousand, every, and the two every thousand were Protestants, totaling about 20, uh, 82,000 people, 82,000 people. Furthermore, there were 47,000 Jews. In 1990, 11, the early census uh, with comparable figures regarding religious affiliation, there have been uh, not uh, 3.9, but 3.6 Protestants every thousand inhabitants, so less. The gist of the matter was that the number of Protestants in Italy had practically had halved in 20 years. This was the tool Mussolini used to preempt and silence the ceaseless flow of complaints, and it's very impressive in the, in the archive, in Vatican archive, that had been coming from the Catholic Church for many years, even before the sign of Concordat. To give an idea, the documents of these matters fill various folders in the Vatican archives. A memo from Tacchi Venturi went so far as to claim that there were more than 200,000 uh, evangelical Christians in Italy, thus maintaining that they had almost doubled over the last 20 years. The popes repeated or tried to repeat these complaints during the talks with Mussolini, who reported him as saying, my attention is drawn to Protestant propaganda, said the Pope, which appear to be on the rise in almost uh, all di dioceses in Italy, according to an inquiry which I, uh, Pius, have had in the bishops make. But Mussolini could now easily retort, I observe that uh, according to the data from the last uh, census, uh, the Protestants in Italy had hardly 135,000, of which 37, are foreigners against 42 million Catholics. Uh, the numbers are wrong, uh, just a little wrong, but uh, these are. Uh, 
uh, Mussolini therefore used these figures to silence the church on the prote Protestant issue, at least for a while. On 13 February, so two, uh, two days later, in the first issue after the talks, uh, first possible, the Observatory Romano published an article, published an article reporting the full census figures and concluding, as Mussolini had done with the Pope, almost the same words, that the country was poorly Catholic. The figures were then repeated the following week by the same newspaper. After this, the church complaints about Protestant propaganda ceased for a while, just for a while, but this was enough. But uh, it was the Pope in particular who dedicated much time and effort, and effort, effort to carefully... <laughs> <laughs> to carefully preparing the talks and confirmed by the fact that two days before the meeting he issued he the Pope issued a precise uh, this is new too a precise and detailed instruction to his Secretary of State Cardinal Pacelli regarding the latter's forthcoming meeting with Mussolini to be held at the meeting of the Pope. We have seen it. In short, it was Cardinal Pacelli's job to deal with the nitty-gritty of the other subject matter of the talks, which he undoubtedly did. We not, not, don't know exactly because we have only this report, but it's almost sure. And to tackle the more contentious issues, for example, then that of the so-called allergenous priest and that it was a very tough subject, German slaves who Mussolini wanted to throw out of the new provinces because he considered them this stabilizing factor in the process of fascization. Instead, the Vatican wanted Christ in those areas who knew the language for the local faithful. But let's see more in detail how Pius XI prepared for or rather staged his battle. The talks with a great deal of care, almost as if he were writing a screenplay. One matter in particular was of special interest to the Pope. Fascist totalitarianism, totalitarianism, fascism on which Pius XI had longly meditated. Mussolini reported a surprising sentence uttered by the Pope. We can understand this totalitarianism in the circle of the state, but besides material interests, uh, there are also in the spirit of ones, and it is here that the Catholic totalitarianism comes in, into effect. So there is a Catholic totalitarianism. As um, Professor Kelsen has spoken about this, uh, a sentence like this, like this, was repeated by Pius XI uh, in September 1938 after the Munich Agreement. Mussolini continues in this way: The Holy Father, at this point, takes a book, looks for a page, takes looks for a page, and thus begins again. Here is a book by Manzoni. It is widely known, La Morale Cattolica. <coughs> Manzoni, generally speaking, is a caution and moderate writer, but in this period he seems to clench his fist. When, says Manzoni, Christ said to apostle, apostles, eunte et docete omnes gentes, Going uh, therefore teach you to all the nations. Oh, we have a, so you can so. a good one. Here it is. It's yellow. The Holy Father at this point uh, takes a book. No problem. 
the Holy Father at this point takes a book, looks for a page, and thus begins again. Here is a book by Manzoni, it's widely known in Morale Cattolica. Manzoni, generally speaking, is a caution and moderate writer, but in this period he seems to clench his fist. When says Manzoni, Christ uh, said to apostles, apostles, Eunte, Docete, Omnis Gentes, going therefore teach you to all the nation, in, in a trust to the church, a, divine, a divine mandate, an order which the church must execute. Really, Pius XI was attacking Mussolini himself, who in a famous speech in the Senate had spoken of a total, totalitarian education at that stage, which included religious education. One can hardly say, like Yves Chiron, a, res, a recent biographer of Pius XI, that this was a courtesy talk. It was a talk. Courtesy. The Pope had set the stage for the meeting with his guests in this library, where he casually found Monzoni's book, Osservazioni sulla Manuale Cattolica. But really, the Pope had already used the same word, equal, quite the same. Uh, and the same example of Manzoni's book in the encyclical Divini Ilius Magistri on 31 December 1920. 29. Then, in a speech during the Sacred Consistory, was published some years ago by a good, a good scholar, Giovanni Coco, of uh, 20, uh, 23 July 1931, uh, at the peak of the clash regarding the Azione Cattolica. One of the passages contained the exact same words spoken to Mussolini, a quote from the Gospel of Matthew. Mm. Mussolini made just one mistake, so just one mistake is uh, uh, is a un test he wrote a un test. What is it? Well, but really, it's a un test. Very small mistake. Yes, a un test docete. Well. We have arrived to the, the, the sentences we have read at the beginning. This one. I, I have not, I, I, it is not necessary, I read again. Is uh, uh, the sen uh, th these are the sentences about the Jews. I I, I made uh, all this uh, introduction. It's a very long I know uh, to say that the Pope prepared this uh, uh, this meeting very carefully, very carefully with the books. One we have already seen one of them, and we had the second. Um, he speaks, uh, yeah, Mussolini speaks, uh, uh, no, um, uh, Pius uh, uh, said, I have received this very day the 35th or th uh, 36th volume of the Russian religious library. I have researched this, uh, and uh, I, uh, I confess I didn't found this uh, book, but because the bibliography in Russia is not very, <laughs> it's not very serious. But uh, with uh, um, a great scholar in, uh, in uh, Russian history, uh, we uh, had the, the limited the possibility to a serial, which is uh, the Anti-Religiosnaya Biblioteca by the, the Soviet League of Militant Godless. It is one of these uh, we could not find, which was the, the thir fifth of the thirty-six. 
But let us examine the following sentence spoken by the Pope to Mussolini. that when he was in Varsav, he saw in all the Bolshevik regiments that his, the civil commissioners, male or female, were invariably Jewish. The reference was to the Russian-Polish war in 19, uh, 1919, 1921, at the advance of the Red Army in August 1920, almost to Warsaw. In August 1920, when Warsaw was about to be besieged, the then Nuncio Ratti was, had remained in the Polish capital, but the city was not conquered by the Bolshevik regiments. So, till today, nobody or I don't know exactly where the future Pope had come into any sort of personal contact with them. So there is a problem. Yeah. Where did um, he look at this? Uh, did he see these commissioners? There is a letter witness account too by a Belgian ambassador to the Vatican, Baron Jens, who reported something different recounted by, uh, to him by uh, the Pope, by his uh, letter. During an audience on 26 February 1923, he talked to the ambassador about the Soviet attack on Varsav, but without mentioning any commissioners or Bolshevik regiments, which in fact he could hardly have seen. Instead, he spoke of the danger, this was the exact word he used, that had increased due to the presence of the outskirts outskirts of the city of uh, 350,000 uh, Jews who were suspected, and doubly wrongly so, this is the, the sentence, of having entered into a sacred agreement with the invaders because of victory of the Soviet, whose major leaders are of Jewish origin, would have appeared as a form of Jew just retribution. We don't know whether the sentence, undoubtedly, wrongly so, was spoken by the Belgian ambassador or by P.U. Pius XI. Uh, but here, too, we see the emergence of the protocols and the conspiracy mentality. I am almost finished. In short, the story about the Jewish commissioners appeared like something strange or invented for Mussolini. We know nothing more in any case regarding to anti-Semitism expressed by Ratti while he was nuncio in Poland, David Kertz has written some conclusive words based on incontrovertible documents of the Nazio of Varsity. <coughs> uh, in the second part of the speech uh, of the Jews, uh, Pius XI distinguished between Italian Jews and in particular several intellectuals uh, he knew personally, however, he added, in Italy, the Jews represented as such. My last word. Immediately after the meeting, Mussolini reported the news to the king that the Pope, going through hard times, clearly had anti-Jewish opinions, who spared only Italian Jews, in particular a couple of intellectuals, and a clerical who were his personal acquaintances. And a rabbi, we have a fan, a fan. It was a good lesson for the future for himself as well, for himself, Mussolini. This also sheds, and so I remember the first document, some light on why Mussolini was taking the document with him to Switzerland in 1945. It was all about the Pope who supported his totalitarian ideas and on those of the Pope himself and was against the Jews and this could be enough. But
you, Dr. Fabre. Uh, we are going to open a discussion now uh, before the lunch break. Uh, we have here, besides all the speakers of the conference, uh, first of all, I'd like to introduce Professor Maggiotta Tabroglio, who finally arrived um, with a small delay, although I think so we can. Uh, um, we will be able to ask questions and to have him participate mm -hmm. in the discussion. Uh, we have here Annalisa Capristo, who is also an expert on the, she's written extensively <coughs> on the exile of Italian Jewish intellectuals uh, following um, the racial legislation and even prior to the racial legislation. We have Franklin Adler, who has been here um, recently uh, at the promotion of Novevi. And uh, um, is also one of the um, U.S.-based experts on Italian uh, uh, fascism, and uh, Paul Arpaia, also a frequent guest of Cento Molevi, and uh, our work on the Zone has been uh, presented here very recently. Um, I, I hope I mentioned everybody. And uh, so we'll open a discussion among the scholars and uh, the members of the public who want to okay <laughs> who want to participate. Um, how shall we? Shall we have Professor Madotta Brolio say a few yeah, words? Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Just some. Um, words to apologize on my absence yesterday, but I think you know the telenovela, <laughs> and I just want to thank you very much the Fondation Cento Primo Levi and Zerilli, and parlo in italiano perché il mio inglese è pessimo ci sono delle ricorrenze nella vita 50 anni fa mezzo secolo io ho pubblicato il primo articolo su questi argomenti nella rivista Nuova Antologia che era di proprietà di Zerini Marimo Guardate la cosa strana. E io ho conosciuto Zerili Marino in quell'occasione perché il redattore della rivista a cui avevo portato mi introdusse nello studio che lui aveva in questa sede romana della nuova antologia che se non ricordo male era la sede della LPT, cioè della Società farmaceutica di Gruzzevilli e la proprietà. There are some recurrent things in life and uh, it's quite unbelievable that 50 years ago I, after I published an article on the subjects that we are discussing today I, which was published on the Nuova Antologia um, Nuova Antologia was owned by Zerili Marimo, um, and the editor, when I went to Rome, um, met me in his office, and in that uh, situation I also met Mr. Zerili Marimo, and I believe that the office was located also in the same building where the headquarters of Le Petit, the pharmaceutical company, was located at that time, for which uh, Mr. Zerili Marimo also um, was working. Thank you very much. Dirò qualche parola sulle relazioni di oggi, mi è stato chiesto, e poi risponderò a una domanda che mi dico mi era stata fatta ieri, cioè era stata fatta dopo la lettura del mio testo sulla politica religiosa dell'ultima fase del fascismo soprattutto di Salò cosa che io non avevo affrontato allora il, eh, ho ascoltato con molto interesse Silvana Patriarca aggiungerei 
eh, due cose. La questione della religione dello Stato nello Statuto Albertino venne svuotata prima del Codice Zanardelli con la legge del giugno 1848 che dichiarava l'uguaglianza di tutti i cittadini senza a prescindere dall'appartenenza religiosa. Fu immediatamente svuotata eh, e lo diceva con riferimento all'accesso alle cariche pubbliche al servizio militare. Comunque parificava tutti i cittadini e lo stesso articolo viene riprodotto nella legge del 29. La, il codice Zanardelli è stato evocato anche in altra relazione, è stato evocato anche da Michele Sarfatti, ma forse nessuno di voi sa che gli articoli sulla parità dei culti del codice Zanardelli non furono scritti da Zanardelli ma da Luigi Luzzatti sì, no, è una scoperta recente perché se no lo, ma lo, colpa mia è Luzzatti che dichiara in uno scritto di essere l'autore quindi questo è interessante non è Zanardelli l'autore è l'ebreo Luzzatti unico presidente del consiglio ebreo della storia d'Italia. So I would like to make a few comments on the uh, <clears throat> on the speeches on the uh, studies that were read today um, which I found very interesting and then I will also answer a question that apparently was asked yesterday but I was not here to answer it about the relation the political relations uh, between the religious politics of the fascist regime particularly during the Salo Republic. Um, now let's start with Silvana Patriarca. I found her study very interesting, but I would like to add two points. Um, the first one is that the uh, issue of the state religion um, in the uh, Statuto Albertino, the uh, Albert Statutes, um, is actually that is not the uh, first time in which uh, that was dealt with. It was dealt with also in uh, June 1848, um, and there was a uh, statement about the equality of all citizens, um, regardless of the, their religion, uh, and that was meant in the sense of the access to public office, uh, to the military service, uh, etc. This was also found in the Trentino region, uh, for instance. Um, and, and then I also wanted to um, speak about the Zanardelli uh, uh, code that also Serfatti mentioned. Um, the article about the parity of all the cults, of all the religion. Well, not everybody knows, and it's quite an, a recent discovery, that uh, the author of those articles was not Zanardelli, but it was actually Luigi Luzzatti. Uh, he uh, wrote that, he divulged that in uh, a recent, um, uh, recently it was found out that he wrote that, and it's important to know that the person to write those articles was actually the only and the sole president of the Jewish Council in Italian history. Thank you very much. Altre due piccole eh, suggerimenti, perché si spera sempre che qualcuno continui. Ci sono. Eh, Silvana Patriarca ha usato il termine che è francese del rapprochement. Ultimamente va di moda, lo hanno 
secondo l'uomo, inventato i canadesi e lo usano molto i francesi, accomodement raisonnable. E nei francesi, nei canadesi, che non studiano la storia italiana, hanno capito che, come si è visto anche dalla relazione della patriarca, gli italiani hanno inventato l'accomodement raisonnable due mesi dopo aver creato la religione dello Stato, dello Statuto Albertino. E in questo quadro del rapprochement o aménagement responsable, purtroppo non ho il tempo, ci sono due personaggi non studiati, di cui uno sì un po' di più, di cui esistono documenti, Monsignor Beccaria. Monsignor Beccaria è un siciliano che dal 1907 al 1953 è il cappellano capo del Quirinale. Pensate lì continuità. 1907-1953. Passa il altro che le continuità. Monsignor Beccaria ha lasciato delle carte, molte, che adesso sono all'archivio centrale dello Stato. Ma è una lunga storia, perché ci sono delle cose anche molto divertenti. Nel 1909, sì, 9 o 10, Pio X e Vittorio Emanuele III si scambiano dei regali. La questione romana, il Deo, il separatismo. Eh? E Beccari, Beccaria fa da tramite diretto fra il re e il papa, sulla testa dei presidenti del Consiglio, tranne Orlando perché Beccaria era un uomo di Orlando. Il barone Monti, il barone Monti direttore generale dei culti, all'allora Ministero della Giustizia, compagno di classe di Benedetto XV. Quando Benedetto XV diventa Papa, il Barone Monti fa la navetta fra il governo e il Papa. Hanno pubblicato i diari del Barone Monti, che sono di grande interesse. E no, scusate, questa la devo, però mi dispiace che la, la devo raccontare. Il barone Monti, molto amico del Papa, viveva in concubinato, non, non era sposato, viveva con una signora. Dal suo diario racconta che nel 1917-18, adesso in quegli anni lì, il Papa gli dice ma tu non puoi continuare in questo modo e lo sposa senza pubblicazione senza niente nella cappella papale il direttore generale dei culti dell'Italia nemica la questione romana e via del genere lo sposa lui dice tu non puoi il direttore dei culti che c'è la cosa ecco, no, perché in fondo si può discutere se il rapprochement sia un segno di serietà o no però c'è cioè, il rapprochement there is another issue that uh, Silvia, Silvia Patriarchia mentioned that she used the French word uh, rapprochement Uh, but there's another uh, word that apparently the Canadians invented, but the French use very freely, which is l'accommodement raisonnable, the reasonable accommodation. And um, the French and Canadians, though, who are not very well versed in Italian history, are not aware that the Italians actually invented the concept. In fact, Just two months after the uh, Albert Statutes, uh, this was already set up in Italy. Um, and uh, I want to mention uh, someone, uh, Monsignor Beccaria, 
who is a Sicilian, and he was the chaplain of the uh, Quirinale uh, Palace, uh, the King's Palace, from 1907 to 1953. And talk about continuity, you know, such a long time. Well, he uh, wrote a diary, and uh, this diary is now in the Central State Archive of Italy. Um, and in this diary, you can find out, for instance, that in 1909 or 1910, I'm not quite sure, my memory, Pius X and uh, Vittorio Emanuele III um, actually exchanged gifts. And this was done without anyone knowing it. It just went over the head of the premier and everyone else in Italy. You know, the state and the church were enemies at that time, but they were exchanging gifts. Um, and also, the minister of cults, the Baron Monti, the general director of the ministry of cults, the Baron Monti, uh, went to school where, you know, was uh, a schoolmate of the, uh, the, what was going to become Benedict the 15th. And therefore, they were very close, you know, so they were public enemies, but private friends. And uh, the Baron Monti uh, was not married, but he was living with a concubine. Well, at some point, the um, Pope decides that there was enough, and it could not go on, so around 1917 or 18, he tells him, you have to get married, and he marries them in the papal chapel. No publication, no paperwork, they just get married, you know? And you can imagine, you know, somebody that is working as a, an official of the enemy state of Italy, so I'm not quite sure if rapprochement should be taken as something serious in this case. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, um, uh, due parole solo nella, nella relazione di Michele Sarfatti che eh, come sempre è completissima su temi che lui conosce eh, approfonditamente. La, la, la questione dell'appartenenza obbligatoria che lui ha ricordato è finita solo nel 1971 con una sentenza della Corte Costituzionale. 71. Ma quello che, il tempo purtroppo, è quello che abbiamo. Ma è molto interessante la polemica che fanno il maestro di Falco. Falco era un professore di diritto ecclesiastico all'Università di Milano. Il suo maestro era Rolfini che è quello che praticamente scrive il discorso contro i patti lateranensi che conosce e conoscerà e l'amico del cuore di Farco era Iemolo e altro professore di... e tutti e due sono critici sulla legge Falco perché considerano che dà troppo potere agli organi delle comunità questa è un po' la cioè quell'idea quell di giurisdizionalismo che ehm, Michele ha ricordato. Quanto allo statu, status delle comunità, io ricordo di essermi occupato di una piccola questione professionale molti anni fa, i dipendenti delle comunità ebraiche italiane ave, avevano lo stesso statuto e la stessa previdenza degli impiegati comunali erano equiparati agli impiegati comunali. Questo per rafforzare quanto diceva Saffatti sulla pubblicizzazione che viene fatta delle comunità ebraiche. Se posso Beh, dire... Che deve tradurre pubblicizzazione, non è facile. Eh? Non è facile tradurre pubblicizzazione. Eh, sta... sì, non lo so come si può dire, ma... Posso dire una confidenza, non, non rompo segreti. Io ho negoziato con le comunità ebraiche l'intesa 
che poi ha sostituito la legge del 29 e una parte della delegazione non voleva assolutamente smontare quella, quell'insieme che Michele ha così chiaramente c'era una parte perché naturalmente come sempre le varie comunità che erano rappresentate non erano d'accordo fra loro ma una parte non voleva perdere lo statuto pubblicistico delle comunità perché questo rispondeva and a few words also on uh, Michele Sarfatti's intervention intervention it was absolutely so complete because I know he knows the subject as the back of his hand um, one thing about the fact that one had to belong compulsorily to one of the um, communities is that that actually ended only in 1971 uh, with a judgment by the Constitutional Court. Um, and also uh, about uh, Falco's law, I want to remember that he was a um, professor of ecclesiastical law and uh, even his old-time professor, as well as his best friend, uh, were critical of uh, the law because they thought it gave too much power. Um, and this is clear also in the fact that uh, the municipal, the, sorry, that the employees of the Jewish communities had exactly the same um, status in terms of welfare and so on that municipal employees had. So this makes it very clear that the uh, uh, Jewish communities were becoming kind of uh, state entities. Publicizzazione? What do you think? <laughs> state entities, maybe. Um, and uh, I don't think I'm going to break any secret also if I tell you all that I'm the one that negotiated uh, sort of an agreement uh, to um, take place of the 1929 law. And I remember at that point that some part of the Jewish delegation uh, was, did not want to, to lose everything that they had achieved uh, with those laws. That was such a highly sought after status that you know some of them were not were very reticent to, to go that far. So not the entire delegation agreed on that. Vengo due parole alla relazione di Giorgio Fabri che ci ha illustrato un documento chiave della, dei rapporti fra Pio XI e Mussolini che appunto ha finito nel così, Mussolini l'aveva portato con lui e è molto interessante quel, tutto quello che lui ci ha detto ma se posso dire lì il più antisemita sembra più 11 rispetto a Mussolini perché è quasi lui che lo incoraggia contro gli ebrei Mussolini sta lì un po' a sentire ma adesso ci sono dei lavori poi persone che hanno studiato questa, questo documento lo, lo, lo pubblicò Corsetti e poi cioè, però io l'impressione che, che, che si ha è che è in questa tesi che sul Messico che, che fa per il ricordato è, 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 continua a uscire fuori questa convinzione di Papa Ratti che tutto quello di male che stava avvenendo nel mondo fosse colpa degli ebrei lo dice chiaramente anche con riferimento alla rivoluzione messicana quindi ecco attenzione poi quando si fa questa con... adesso io qui parlo sotto il controllo di Kerzer che ne sa molto più di me ma che questa, quando si fa questa contrapposizione ratti pacelli eh, pacelli nero e ratti bianco boh, non lo so io ho molti dubbi che questo ratti fosse così rispetto a e non solo, poi non, non dimentichiamo che le modifiche alla Mitbrenender Zorge, 
sono di pugno di pascelli, non di latte. Le modifiche che irrigidiscono il documento sono di pascelli, non sono di latte. Comunque lì il discorso è lunghissimo. Sì. So, a few words also on uh, Giorgio Fabri's contribution. He showed us a key document. Uh, um, about the relations between Pius XI and Mussolini, so something so important that Mussolini took it with him. Um, definitely very interesting. Um, but I have to say, I think Mussolini comes out of it as more anti-Semite than Pius XI, because it, it, uh, uh, Pius XI uh, looks more anti-Semite than Mussolini, because it looks like he, he is encouraging him, you know, to come up with those statements. Uh, but it's something that was, has been published and Corsetti wrote on, on that subject as well. Um, but I, I want to say uh, something also about that strong conviction that uh, uh, Papa, the Pope, Ratti had about the Jews, that everything was the fault of the Jews, even the Mexican Revolution. But we have with us Professor Kurtzer, who um, is very knowledgeable in that field. So, um, but I have my doubts about the fact that, you know, Pacelli is all black and Ratti is all white. I'm not too sure. And let's not forget that the changes to the Hender Zorge is the against well the changes were actually penned by Pacelli not by Ratti uh, aggiungo solo una cosa a proposito di questo ma forse mi è già uscita fuori della testa una cosa che volevo aggiungere rispetto a uh, Ratti mi tornerà. Due parole per rispondere alla questione eh, Repubblica di Salò e la mia relazione, di cui mi scuso ancora perché era un po', spero che eh, grazie al, agli amici che l'hanno tradotta sia stata comprensibile. Io mi sono fermato al concordato, non ho continuato e qualcuno mi dica non ha chiesto qual era stata la politica religiosa della Repubblica Sociale. Allora, per capire questo bisogna partire dal 1941. Nel 1941 il governo fascista, e in particolare Grandi e Mussolini, si accorgono che è stato uno sbaglio non aver fatto una Costituzione fascista. Cioè che sono un po' strangolati dallo Stato d'Albertino e allora si comincia a studiare il modo di creare un ordinamento giuridico fascista. All'Università di Pisa nel 1941 si fa un grande convegno a cui partecipano tutti i più importanti giuristi italiani alcuni che saranno dei noti antifascisti qualche tempo dopo, ma sono tutti lì a costruire lo Stato fascista. È di un interesse enorme, non è stato quasi mai studiato, è scomparso da molte biblioteche universitarie, gli atti sono scomparsi. Io ho fatto una piccola indagine, e, ma quando esce il volume, perché il proprio, tutti noi che facciamo i congrimi sappiamo che poi strappare le relazioni ai professori Beh, il volume esce a giugno del 43 che eravamo ormai un po' in ritardo ma è molto interessante perché oltre a esserci un disegno di quello che doveva essere lo stato fascista vero c'è tutta una parte sulla politica religiosa sulla legislazione religiosa e adesso non posso scendere sulla, e in appendice c'è un progetto di costituzione che non ha studiato quasi nessuno cioè un progetto di costituzione fascista 
in cui c'è un articolo della Costituzione che non è uguale ma è molto simile all'articolo 7 della Costituzione che abbiamo e quando si arriva al Salon quello che era stato l'anima del convegno di Pisa un professore di diritto costituzionale che si chiamava Biggini diventa ministro dell'educazione nazionale a Salon e Mussolini e Mussolini incarica lui di preparare una costituzione per la Repubblica Sociale So, um, a little bit about the uh, Republic, the Social Republic in Salò. Um, I, I want to thank, first of all, uh, everybody that contributed to translating at the last minute my contribution, and I hope that it was understandable yesterday. Uh, but in any event, let me reply to that aspect about the um, religious policy of the uh, Republic in, in Salon. Um, let's, make, let's step back a little. In 1941, Grandi and Mussolini realized that they had made a mistake not to create a fascist constitution because actually the Albert Statutes was strangling them. Uh, and so they um, uh, called for all the major Italian uh, experts in, in law, in juridical studies and so on, to convey in Pisa for a great conference. Uh, and everybody was there, even some that later became anti-fascist. Um, and it's interesting to notice that the acts of this conference disappeared from the, some of the university libraries around Italy. But in any event, these acts were finally published, and they were published in 1943, a bit late. Um, but uh, in, the, in this volume, you can find that there is actually a design that is coming together for the new fascist state. And there is a part on the um, religious politics of the state. In the end, there's even an appendix on a constitutional plan. My question is, after the concordat and the law on Jewish communities, Jews were likely to become, once again, a segregated community. Is the law something like the first racial law promoted by fascism as even a critic of the backdating of fascist antisemitism, like Alberto Cavaglione maintained? We also remember uh, the, the paper uh, Professor Maggiotta Broglio and also Guido Fubini book. Uh, um, Fubini spoke about the first step uh, toward 1938. Put in other words, according to your interpretation of antisemitism within fascism as a maturing process that is not a necessary, inescapable outcome of fascism, but a sort of ripening, a development which was consistent with some of its premises. What do you think about the meaning of the 1930 law within this process? The second question is um, strictly um, related to the other. You mentioned the withdrawals from Judaism after the enactment of the 1930 law. As you pointed out in your book on Italian Jewish and Jews in Mussolini's Italy, people who withdrew from the Jewish communities between 1931 and 1937 were about uh, seven, 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 747, um, not such a few. Could we interpret the withdrawal also as an effect of the threatening climate and to the political pressures of those years? For instance, through recurring press campaigns permitted or even directly orchestrated by Mussolini. You mentioned the uh, well-known episode of um, November, uh, occurred um, between November and December 1990. In 1928, we can uh, remember also other press campaigns. I remember, for instance, the, the, the attack uh, on the press, on the fascist press, after the, uh, the, and the raid uh, against the Padua synagogue, uh, after the, the attempt to kill Mussolini in 1926, uh, 
in, the, in the archive of the Union of the Jewish Community in Rome, there is a lot of documentation about, uh, uh, that describe the anxiety of many, many Jews about this episode and the, and the uh, attack of pre Jew and fascist press against the Jews. Uh, in a letter um, by Giuseppe Pandoropoulos, uh, he, he, <coughs> he feared that uh, this climate could affect could affect uh, the Jews, and if Mussolini uh, had, had, would have been killed, what kind of reaction Jews uh, could be uh, could expected? He, 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 told, he spoke about, uh, about a retaliation, a terrible retaliation against the Jews. The second, the question for. Um, uh, in, uh, in stando in piedi su, su piede solo, as you say, it's very difficult to, to answer to. Uh, but the, 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 the main, uh, I will speak half in English and half in Italian. The, 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 really, the main difficulty is to try to understand uh, from a Jewish, uh, looking at the Jews, which was the behavior of the, come si dice, average, average Jew, cioè del, del, del ebreo medio. Uh, there were uh, 200 of the typology of being Jews in that, in, that, in that period. I'm speaking about the, the, the second, I'm answering that starting to answer with the second question. Uh, <coughs> the law, the Falco law, obliged the people who were linked to Judaism to choose, or entirely in the communities, or entirely out of the communities. So all the people who were in a medium position they were okay, they were Jews, but they were, they were no more going in synagogue and so on, but they were linked to the inheritance of, <coughs> of father and mother, etc. They had to choose. And this is part of the centralization e regimentation. Many hundreds of people of this kind choose to oh, clear up, to make a cut with the Judaism and they went away from the, from, from, from the communities. Um, it's difficult to explain this thing here, where in the States nowadays, where all is voluntary, everyone does what he wants uh, entirely in uh, part or, or not. But the, the most important thing is that the law uh, obligò gli ebrei a scegliere. This is a thing that uh, Zraffa writes in, uh, in one of his letters to, to, Tatiana, to Tatiana Schultz. Uh, uh, in such a way, a, 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 a top percent, I don't know why, I'm, I'm unable to, 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 to say how much, of the Jews who were uh, pushed by the law to baptize themselves. Because when you are out, when you decide to be out, but you need as a personal being, not as a Jew or a Christian, to have a religion, you go and take the, 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 the easiest religion to, to, to have. Uh, this is only a few comments about your, your very complex question. For, uh, relating to the first one, uh, uh, I think that Mussolini wanted to uh, give a, a rule, a, a bureaucratic rule to the Jewish community independently from the marching on of the, uh, uh, of the state antisemitism which was uh, uh, immaturazione and which was uh, concretizzato by the expulsion of the Jews from uh, the main important uh, um, representative place in society in, uh, uh, in, 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 in many fields. Uh, uh, 
fascism, my opinion, my personal opinion, fascism needed to have in the society only uh, entità uh, organizzate e controllate eh, dal, dall'alto. Um, e la cosa, the, 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 one of the interesting things is that when we arrive at the anti-Jewish laws, um, the laws didn't change anything in the uh, Falco laws regarding to the communities. And uh, that Maggio Tabroglio, or oh, oh, pupil of Maggio Tabroglio, discovered the documents uh, a, 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 a proposal of law which never became law that would oblige all the people of uh, uh, Jewish race, from a biological and not the religious point of view, uh, all the people of Jewish race had to inscribe, uh, became member of the Jewish communities. So this was a proposal never, non è mai diventata legge, ma l'organizzazione delle eh, comunità ebraiche serviva allo Stato per, per regolare la società sono social controller per controllare it was the Jews who were very glad to have an agreement with the state and, uh, and the, it was the Jews that decide Okay, we have the law, so we do not have the, the, the establishment of the Jews, the, the, the manager of communities. So we will not risk to have a law anti Semite. The, the, the behavior of, this, of Mussolini and of the, fascist, the regime fascista was different. From this point of view, I don't think that the 1930 law was the first anti-Semitic law in, uh, in Italy. I think that there was a kind of, uh, it's very difficult to say, but a kind of uh, independenza. A para, perhaps the, 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 the best word is parallelismo. We, you can understand parallelismo uh, in English. Of these two, uh, two piani, two, two, two level. But maybe uh, I cannot make another <laughs> conference. I, I have, a, I, I, I hope, a, almost one third or one, one fifth of your question. I, I have answered. I, I have a question to, to, to Giorgio uh, Fabri. Uh, when Mussolini says to the king that the Pope has said A, B, C, D, etc., he is saying really what the Pope has adopted, or he has chosen, like when you choose uh, the flowers in a field to make a composition, a scelto questo, questo, and when he say the, 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 the word of the Pope are this, are so and so and so, can we be sure that the that really these were the words of the Pope, or there is some kind of uh, uh, voluntary misin voluntary, no, not misunderstanding, but deformation, voluntary. Cioè, uh, the, 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 the real question is, uh, which is the grade of uh, credibility, uh, of, of credibility of the, the, the That the, the letter you showed us, but also all the letter of this kind when uh, one man says, report the, the thinking of another one, in, in this case, the chief of government, Pope and uh, King. No, no. Just a very good question to Michele. Um, Professor Falco was not the representative the Jewish community, but it was the representative chosen by Mussolini. It was the representative the Jewish Yes, it was. It was it, yes? Not the, in the... In the no. No, the, the, uh, 
at the beginning we had the, 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 the little committee uh, yeah. um, nominato by the Jewish community with yes. Falco Foa yes. yes. uh, but, but after after he was appointed by Duke Mussolini. Yeah. Yeah, but, uh, yes, question. Uh, Question. Well, uh, we don't know exactly what, uh, or absolutely, what uh, Pius XI uh, told to Mussolini. But uh, uh, the document uh, uh, we saw at the beginning, uh, I think uh, it is a form of control of uh, what uh, the Pius, in some way, of Pius XI said. Because it, this is the first uh, time in which Mussolini, on speaking to Bernardini Duca, uh, spoke of the Jews in, the, in, the, in this way. And so, uh, mm, it's, it's very difficult to think that uh, he, uh, well, he answered to. to Bogogini Duca about the Aldovinzi uh, in this way, if uh, he was not sure that on the other side he had a counterpart, uh, how can we say, uh, homologous. <laughs> and so we don't know, you are right, and so and I propose that uh, Mussolini say, said something in between. With, uh, a part and the other of uh, the, the the answer of um, uh, Pius uh, eleven, but we are almost sure that uh, um, uh, uh, the Pope said something it is about the, the, the Bolsheviks, uh, Judaism, and so on. And those it, it is uh, the. That of uh, uh, 12 of August uh, 1932 uh, is the first time that uh, Mussolini, with the Vatican representative, uh, spoke in this way of, uh, because he had a, a reason of, of the Jews. In, in a tough way. It's a very difficult problem. Unpleasant. Unpleasant. Right. I have a second question to, uh, George, um, for Giorgio Fabre. Um, you spoke about the, this talk uh, between the Pope and Mussolini in February 1932, in which, during which uh, the Pope um, told Mussolini that the Italian Jews uh, are, are good, are, uh, represented an exception uh, in the if uh, compared to other Jews uh, in the world. In, in this uh, part of, of the record, I see a con a, a, such a continuity between the attitude of the Pope uh, um, uh, toward the Jewish intellectual or, or intellectual of Jewish origin. Because uh, for the Jewish intellectuals, uh, the Pope makes a lot of, of uh, exceptions. He uh, appointed uh, in, uh, in 1931 Giorgio Levi della Vida after uh, he uh, lost his chair uh, due to re the refusal of the fascist oath uh, um, in, the, in the Vatican Library. And in the, in, he uh, appointed uh, in, in the following years Italian and foreign Jews, intellectual, uh, at, the li at the Vatican Library and also in the Pontifical Academy. Mm, of sciences. Uh, Tullio Levi Civita was appointed in 1929 a member, the first Jewish uh, member of the, uh, so um, at the time the, the Pontifical Academy is named the Pontificia Academia dei Nuovi Lincei, and then in 1936 uh, it became uh, the Pontificia Academia delle Scienze. Uh, after uh, Levi Civita probably was refused as a member of the Academy of Italy. And uh, also in the following years, he um, appointed Vito Volterra as a member of the Pontifical Academy, and so on. Uh, Roberto Almagiar was uh, received in a, a, um, a, a, 
restoration from uh, the, the, the Vatican Library. So I see a, 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 a continuity in, in this attitude, or the, the papal attitude. Uh, instead, Mussolini, uh, 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 just in 1932, uh, uh, excluded uh, Jewish, uh, uh, Jewish scholars from, for instance, the Academia d'Italia. And just after, a few days after this talk between Mussolini and the Pope, the, there was a draft uh, addressed by some academicians of Italy to Mussolini to know if they could obtain and appoint Jewish members of the Academy. And so, do you think that this some, Mussolini did, did not, uh, was not convinced by the Pope that the Jews, Italian Jews were so good to be appointed in, uh, for instance, in the Academia d'Italia? In some way you are answering to Professor Maggiotto Parolio said that uh, uh, Mussolini was uh, a best anti-Semitist uh, than, 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 than uh, On the contrary, uh, I think that uh, probably Mussolini was, most, uh, was more uh, anti-Semite than the Pope because he continued to exclude uh, Jewish, uh, Jewish scholars from some representatives, high ranks uh, of Italian cultural and, and social media. Uh, there are some exceptions, like Mr. Uh, Jung, but there are exceptions. Well, may, may, may I ask you something may. about this? So, so, so you will give a, yeah. uh, uh, a total three, uh, and 360 degrees <laughs> answer. <laughs> well, uh, the more impressive thing in uh, this um, document uh, is that uh, um, uh, Pius apparently, but it's, it's, it's so, that uh, Pius XI uh, is talking about a uh, rabbi. And so I think that uh, on uh, um, that he. Uh, I can say is is a scrooding and anti semit and Catholic anti semitism on a, on a, a point of view a spiritual I mean a religious point of view because uh, uh, Jesus Christ was Jew and so on and so on because the, the, the was the, the Old Testament that is uh, a part of the, the Catholic uh, faith. And uh, this is, is very interesting uh, on a, a plane, a theoretical plane, because it, it's excluded that uh, Pius XI uh, is a spiritual and a religious antisemitism, as many scholars said in recent years too. About and. Uh, more interesting is, uh, and this is uh, no, I'm uh, working about this uh, team at this moment, uh, that uh, really uh, we, 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 we know that uh, um, Pius XI uh, 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 met two times the final, one in 1931 to discuss the situation of Jews in Russia, and this is very, very interesting. And second, on 29th March of 1933, note the date, to discuss with uh, Pius uh, uh, XI the situation of German Jews. In both cases, uh, uh, that we know just we know not so much, but in uh, uh, both cases. Uh, uh, so when uh, this uh, when uh, Pius XI uh, uh, said to Mussolini that he had a relation with uh, uh, Rabbi Raffano uh, was true. This is confirmation. Was true. I said nothing more about these uh, two uh, issues because uh, <coughs> I'm working, I'm not sure about something, and so on. Uh, 
Uh, about uh, the, the, the other question, so the question is, some days uh, after this uh, talk between Mussolini and... That was February. Uh, 11. 11. 11. 11 February. Uh, and there, were, there was uh, the first uh, mm, meeting between uh, the commissioners of uh, Ac uh, Academia d'Italia to discuss the new nominees of the Academy. And we know nothing about this discussion, but we know from the document that uh, 20 days after this meeting, uh, the, uh, one of uh, the secretary of this commission asked to Mussolini, this is interesting, if uh, the Academia d'Italia uh, could nominee uh, a, a Catholic, a Catholic, uh, not a Catholic, a normal Catholic, a, a cardinal or a bishop and so on, with uh, some cultural merit, but anyway a Catholic, and second, um, the Jews. About, I, I don't remember uh, well because uh, it is not the main, main, uh, main field, this, but uh, I remember that about uh, the, the, the Jews, uh, we have not a, a clear answer, we have no answer, uh, I mean a written answer by Mussolini, but uh, we are sure they were excluded. For the second time, the first one was in 1929, the second in 1932, and the third in 1933, were also excluded from Academia d'Italia, and was uh, excluded uh, uh, with intention, not carefully. <coughs> so, which is the relation of this? With uh, I don't know, really I don't know. It's very complex. We are talking of a secret story, not a, a open story. We are talking of a secret story. This, but maybe real story, <laughs> because I don't know. But I'm sure that after this uh, meeting, this talk, Mussolini changed his mind. In relation with, in some way, and not totally, in some way, change his mind with, uh, uh, in relation with uh, the church about the Jews, uh, the argument of the Jews. Thank you. I think Michele had a no, follow up question. No, 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 uh, Michele, uh, on the distinction you made, an analytic distinction between whether this is an instance of anti-Semitism or control of the state, if we look at other spheres of Italy, 1927 to 1934, this is when the corporative order is being established. And a very important word was used, inquadramento that every economic category had to be in, inquadrato, nello stato. Could it be that this could account for also to inquadrato the Jews, no longer an autonomous category, but one framed within the state? And it might have had to do with that logic of an emerging, quote, totalitarian state and not necessarily something religious, simply a category that had to be framed. Um, yes. Uh, my opinion is that the Falco law was a law of irregimentazione, inquadramento, uh, and also accentramento. I, it, it was... A, a, independent from the enacting or not enacting of antisemitism. Um, I, I, don't, uh, I don't 
don't, 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 don't link the, the two things because my opinion is more interesting to see that the uh, bishops were obliged in uh, 1929 to make uh, juramento of uh, oath and the chief rabbis not. So you, you, you can see the, the different of treatment, the, 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 the Catholic Church is the anima de la nation and the Jews are <coughs> something not directly linked with the nation. And we can see that in this difference there is something leading Italy towards antisemitism. But <coughs> I prefer to, to make distinction and uh, to, to take not, not to say that the things were separate, but to study in a separate way the two, uh, the two parts, the, the path towards fascistizzazione, inquadramento, irregimentazione, and the path towards antisemitism, which were in some way parallel. But if I can add something you here, have whether, <laughs> yeah, so my, my take on this is that it is important to uh, you know, debate about uh, ideas, but at the same time we have to think about uh, practices that have effects, laws that have effects, or you know, the introduction of something that may have an effect on the minority. So if we want to escape from this kind of, you know, trying to find exactly when, <coughs> when Mussolini started to be, to be anti-Semite or not, etc., it's actually what he did that could create more marginalization for the community. Uh, of believers who before existed with some freedoms, and now it becomes, uh, <coughs> um, you know, uh, let's say, surveilled and uh, uh, organized uh, in a certain way. So I think that somehow we uh, we really run at risk if we do not see, um, you know, the effect, the actual effects of certain laws. And at the same time, I wanted to, um, uh, and so. See, see uh, these developments that sum up together in the same field of visions. And at the same time, you know, touche with Professor, uh, um, professor <laughs> before, he, when he told me about, well, you know, Italians, so they are doing their thing to making compromises all the time, and, <laughs> you know, they, they are all Catholics, and so they are friends even across Etc. But at the same time, it does make a difference because you teach me right, the type of uh, um, legislation and the type of uh, laws that exist. Right? It does. So we should not take them um, always at face values in the sense that practice is matters and sometimes there are um, uh, contrasts, there are gaps between, uh, between uh, laws and practices. But you know, we have to give a certain Wait also to these um, to these things. Um, so, so this would be my attempt to say that uh, uh, many different aspects, of many different dimensions have to be taken uh, into consideration at the same time. So, ideas, legislation, um, uh, mentalities. Uh, anyway, many many different things, but. But we do have uh, to somehow move beyond only, uh, only yeah. oh yeah. So m moving beyond the um, you know the examination of one aspect uh, on its own only, um, because there are again there are consequences for people who are in a different relations to the majority culture. Right? <coughs> so that's the to me that seems to be the most important thing that is uh, writing this kind of history with in mind the position of the, of the minority in relation, in relation to state legislation, to the dominant culture, and so on, and seeing that position as illuminating, this is something we were discussing before, as illuminating also uh, the practices, uh, the dominant practices. So that's, um, which somehow does, does not, is not done most of the time. Right, because uh, the church is studied on, it, on its own, 
uh, Jewish history is done on its own, and it doesn't come in to, um, uh, to revise the narrative, the dominant <coughs> narrative of, uh, um, of church and state or of Italian society and so on. So, which is what I sort of care about, rewriting a bit this narrative. Not assuming that Italy is only Catholic, but it's, it includes other people. And seeing how other people have been treated within makes, uh, I mean, it's, total, it's completely important. <coughs> no, if I may, I think this thing, all, right? all that notwithstanding, there was a logic to the fascist state. That was there were to be no islands of autonomy in principle that could be left standing whether they were religious or, or any other. Not that the practice ever worked out that way. And in terms of the church, whatever autonomy it had as a result of the Lateran Pacts is revisited in 38 with the idea that no, uh, Pius XI will have to submit to the new racial legislation. And Pacelli goes, goes along with it. So whatever autonomy the, the Vatican had, in 1929 and 30 was reduced by the same logic that I'm talking about. Of course, minorities are going to be affected by history. That, that, that goes without question. I, I, I think uh, Professor Majota has a, a comment and then oh. in the back. Just a minute. I agree with you, the idea that the law and Jewish communities and also the Latin agreements, they are a part of the totalitarian state. I don't know if you know an old book of Alberto Acquarone. Yeah, who started totalitarian. So I, I knew him in Rome, yes. And, and I think this is a, a totalitarian politics, you know, or the control on the um, bishops and the uh, parish, they are very strong. And I think I agree with you. We have to read all this politics in the framework of the idea of the totalitarian state. Um, yesterday, part of the discussion was about religious public education. I wonder is there any uh, historical evidence of what the position of Giovanni Gentile was in this respect? Uh, uh, it is very simple. Giovanni Gentile considered the study, the religion, philosophia inferior. <laughs> yeah. Philosophia inferior. The young people at primary school was not able to study philosophy. But if the children began studying religion, this was permanent for philosophical reason in the, yes. This was the idea of Gentile. That religion prepared, the study of religion prepared the study of philosophy. But it was yeah, Gentile yeah. who ob 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 uh, obliged to teach Catholicism at the primary school yes. in 19 yeah. primary in 1923. Yes, but he, he, that he, he was not agree with the study of religion in uh, superior school. No, I, 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 I don't know about religion in general, about the antagonism. Because you know, it's a big cross. Yes, in the primary, but not in the. Uh, okay. No. Uh, okay. yes. Thank you. A gentleman in the back, yes. Yeah, I published a book on Trieste. And it's an interesting situation. Here's a Jewish population that gets absorbed into Italy in uh, 1918, etc. And uh, the question is under Orr Street, did they have a better deal than they were getting into? They were enthusiastic to go to Italy, I understand that. Probably because of the conversion glass ceiling, Mala can't be the head of the conductor until he becomes a Protestant. Academia, you have to become a Protestant, to, or I mean a Catholic, it's a Catholic country, in order to get the high positions. But in a certain sense, uh, and there's anti-Semitic mayors of them, 
Vienna. But in a certain sense, didn't they feel on the ground that they really had more of a chance to uh, better themselves in, a, in an Austrian situation than they would in an Italian situation? Because the facts that you're giving is that these areas also had kinds of ceilings that became even legal under certain uh, fascist and certain <coughs> opinions of, of the popes. Uh, so maybe the, the transition wasn't such a, a night and day kind of thing. Were they better off becoming Italians than having Austria as their legal framework? <laughs> That's the this is a question for me, but, yes. but certainly Michele knows much more about that question. Because isn't that also similar to what the um, uh, Italian Jews becoming Italian? I mean, Jews who lived in the ancient, in the old states becoming Italian, then they have to, um, they, they are emancipated, but they also have to give up certain things, like they have, they recognize divorce, right? Yes. Communities. Yes. The Italian state does not recognize it. So how did they react to that? Were they because they were patriotic, so they were happy to be they part were patriotic of and nationalistic, and uh, so they, some of them became chauvinist. Mm -hmm. More, most of the Jews of Trieste were irredentisti, were pro annexation to. To Italy. So they were okay giving up certain things yes. like that. Yeah. Okay. So that's, that would be the answer. So you give, you you have something in a change that it's worth more, right? Participation, participation in this uh, mistake. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. I have a million dollar question. <laughs> uh, uh, I, I, I made the fanatic for chronology, <laughs> completely fanatic. And a uh, few weeks after the meeting, uh, he, Giorgio documented us to this morning, uh, there was the publication, the printing of the famous interview by Emilio Ludwig to Mussolini. And uh, in this interview, I have an English translation. Uh, Mussolini told, or he said to have told, uh, well, but anyway, he corrected the proof, so um, we can be sure. Uh, quote, antisemitism does not exist in Italy. Italian Jews have always, have always conducted themselves well as citizens and uh, as soldiers, they fought bravely. They occupy high position in the university, in the army, in banks. It's uh, this a world quite similar to the Pope world. In the same days, there were the um, the, the, the conclusion of the pro conclusion, the continuity of the process of expulsions of Jews from high rank. Uh, I rank a position in a university in the state and so on. And in the same days, in April, the representative in Italy of Vladimir Jabotinsky, the chief of the uh, Zionist uh, Revisionist Organization, wrote to Jabotinsky, there is the letter in uh, Jerusalem, in the archives, I'm quoting, that is April 32, one year before Hitler came to power, no? Remember this. Uh, quote, Hitlerism in various countries sees Rome as the mecca of antisemitism. So, we have to think to the meaning of the word antisemitism before Hitler went to power. It was a different meaning, a more, a little of a more soft meaning. I, I don't know the right English word, but we can understand. And this man writes to Jabotinsky saying, Rome is the mecca of antisemitism. So something was going on in Italy. We no, many, the, the Italian word is brandelli. How can you say brandelli? Bits and pieces. 
and we, we know, thanks to Giorgio and Annalisa, we know many brandelli of this, but we, we do not have, non abbiamo trovato il bandolo. The whole picture, the, the, the whole the picture. picture. So it's very interesting that while this is happening, and this man, Isaac Shaki, writes to Jabotinsky these things, that the Pope, in such way, in, in, in that way, and Mussolini in this other way, say, are, are saying, for us, Italian Jews are little different from the other. In the words of Mussolini, there, there was inside a, a, a minaccia, a, a menace, a menace but it's, it's not here the place to, to, to study his declaration. But perhaps something was happening, and perhaps the, 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 it's, it's only a question, a, a scientific question, I have absolutely no idea in this moment. Perhaps the Pope wanted to say something to Mussolini, obviously, not to the king. In this moment, uh, be quiet. The, 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 the Annalisa told something uh, uh, in this sense, in the, with this meaning. Uh, be careful with going too much on, too much forward with, with, with antisemitism. Italian Jews in, night, in uh, spring, in, uh, late winter, spring 1933, we, 32, we have to make difference between the Judaism, the world Jewry, Masonic, Bolshevik, the, the liberal, and so on, and the Italian Jews. What, what, what do you think? I, I, I'm not a, a clear idea, but I'm interested if you have a clear yeah, not idea. Not clear, but I, I think it's, it's, at first, I, I think that it's, uh, it's a secret. Uh, history, we are second history. We are talking of documents that we now know, uh, and uh, it. Uh, I think I'm, I'm, uh, I'm speaking to Sorosodiaske. I think that it changed the total history. The, this, I mean the secret history, and we have to know it. Uh, second, <coughs> I suspect that this meeting is uh, a bundle. I, I don't know what it's but, it's a, but a, a crucial, crucial, uh, crucial, a crucial uh, uh, point, crucial, uh, yeah. of, uh, a crucial point because it was the first and only meeting of the uh, vertexes of uh, the state of the church. And that is uh, the most uh, important, most important uh, uh, entities for uh, a problem uh, religious like the, the Jews and the minorities, quite defined by religion at first. And so uh, this is very, very important. Uh, uh, and you are right. Uh, we we have to, to to be very car careful. Consider it because it is Mussolini who write to, uh, to the king about what uh, the Pope said, but uh, without uh, write without writing what he himself said. This is the problem. I we don't know yet. Just a moment. You are right about Ludwig. Too. Um, Ludwig, uh, I will cut uh, I cut off a uh, part. Uh, um, in the first edition of uh, uh, Colloquy, there is uh, all a, a large part uh, dedicated uh, to the me uh, to the meeting of uh, uh, Mussolini with uh, uh, with the Pope, uh, who uh, in the second edition uh, the Mussolini changed uh, and saying uh, to I wrote it in uh, secretary to uh, um, uh, ambassador Italian ambassador De Vecchi uh, that uh, that uh, dirty Jew the quale uh, mi ha tradito perché ha raccontato, he, he ha raccontato le cose e quindi bisogna anche analizzare quello e quello è effettivamente qualche settimana dopo uh, io mi fermo qui perché è veramente complicato però quello può essere un punto di snodo vero 
Unfortunately, I think we have to close here. I'd like to thank very much our panelists, both from tonight and uh, from yesterday. Uh, thank you. First of all, I want to thank Primo Levi Center, Natalia, and Alessandro, and Casa Lili Nemo for this invitation. I'm very happy to be here. So my talk is uh, intended to illustrate uh, the response, the reaction of Italian Jewish institutional and cultural elites to the religious policies introduced by the fascist regime from 1923 to 1930. For this purpose, I will be examining the initiatives of the Consorzio delle Comunità Israelitiche Italiane. We heard about it in Michele Sarfatti's presentation this morning the central organization that had represented Italian Jewish communities since 19, 1911. And here I realize I've made a mistake. Uh, there were two vice presidents, Felice Rovenna and Angelo Sullam. And now we'll be analyzing the commentary that appeared in the Jewish press. Uh, that is to say, in the weekly newspaper called Israel, the leading Jewish publication, and for some time the only one, at least until the end of the 20th, active, uh, active in Italy. Uh, Israel uh, was a pro-Zionist paper that was deeply, extremely deeply committed to rebuilding and reworking the Jewish identity, and so the increasing assimilation of Italian Jews as its main enemy and target of criticism. Um, I'm aware that I have chosen a partial vantage point, the institutional leadership and the cultural elite, that certainly does not encompass all the various and different positions that emerge within the Italian Jewish world with regard to the uh, religious uh, policies. And yet I, I believe it is a significant perspective insofar as it translated into the public, official viewpoint of the Jewish-Italian community. Due to time limitations, I have chosen to focus only on three critical points in the evolution of fascist policy on religion. So this list, uh, therefore, does not include all the initiatives by the regime that undermined the principle of religious equality before the First is the educational reform of the fall of 1923, the so-called Gentile reform, by the name of the Ministry of Education, the philosopher Giovanni Gentile, who deeply shaped and wanted uh, this reform. Second step is the Concordat, of course, of February 1929. And the third step is the law of June 1929, the so-called law on permitted denominations. <coughs> And, uh, it's more important, I would say, the implementing regulations issued with the decree of February 1930 regarding the law of June 1929. My thesis, uh, which in some ways may sound uh, controversial or provocative, and maybe it is, is that overall, the Jewish institutional and cultural leaders did not manage to fully grasp the threats inherent in the religious policies introduced by fascism. While the representatives of the consortium kept a close eye on the evolution of the regime's religious policies, though they had no way of really doing anything to modify its course, the debates that unfolded around these issues within the Italian Jewish community's central institution or the very limited examination of these issues in the Jewish press did not seem to show a complete <coughs> awareness of the profoundly illiberal implications of fascist religious policies, nor the overall strategy of discrimination underlying them. And in conclusion, I will try to uh, outline the factors which, according to my opinion, I believe contributed to this failure to uh, realize what was happening. So the first point, the first step was the educational reform. From 1923 
From the very outset, the fascist administration followed a clear policy of eroding citizen religious freedoms and the principle that all religions were equal before the law. The first significant step in this direction came as early as autumn 1923 with the approval of the educational reform proposed by the Minister of Education, Giovanni Gentile. This reform established the preeminence of Catholicism throughout the educational system, creating blatant distinctions for those who practiced other religions. Article 3, as you can read in the slide, of the law of October the 1st, 1923 stated that, I quote it, the foundation and crowning aim of elementary instruction at all levels is to be the teaching of a Christian doctrine in the form passed down by Catholic tradition, end of quote. The new law implicitly sanctioned the idea that Italian and Catholic identity were one and the same, envisioning that Italians of tomorrow, envisioning the Italians of tomorrow as citizens trained in the schoolroom to identify with the cultural and religious tradition on which their education was based. Being Italian from then on, from 1923 on, meant being Catholic. Not being Catholic meant that one's Italian identity was open to debate. The law provoked extreme concern at the consortium. Uh, the reactions to it were numerous and the issue of education would continue to monopolize the organization initiatives in the years that followed. And yet, as we will see, neither the consortium's initiatives nor the articles that appear in the Jewish press asked for the law to be repealed or for a return to the principle of secularism in the public schools that had been established after the unification of Italy and maintained until 1923. The secular nature of public schooling was not seen by Italian Jewish leaders as a value to be defended. Instead, the idea seemed to prevail that secular schools had fostered and intensified the dangerous process of assimilation that the minority was experiencing. Some articles that appeared in Israel uh, over the course of 1923 were significant from this standpoint. In December 1923, Enzo Sereni, one of the founders of the Italian Zionism, one of the leading figure of uh, Jewish Italian history, called uh, Education Minister Giovanni Gentile, I quote, courageous and intelligent, end of quote, and wrote in this article, the secularization of schooling, the aim at Catholicism, as also, and we would say, above all, arm us, us as Jews. It is with joy that we hail God's return to the classroom. <laughs> and Dante Latte, deputy editor of Israel, took a critical stance toward fellow Jews who supported a secular education, implicitly applauding this shift in fascism. This is a quotation from another article appeared in Israel from Dante Lattes. He said, the non-Jewish world, having abandoned agnostic currents and tenets that deny the spirit, seem intent on returning to the paths of its fate. Will the Jews remain the only ones to reveal in demagogic proclamations about secular schooling and about religion being only a private matter? It was a rhetoric question, of course. After the case of dangerous, uh, according to the Jewish standpoint view from the institutional, the Jewish point of view. Uh, after the case of dangerous secularism, positivism, and rationalism, these segments of the Italian Jewish community saw the Gentile reform as an opportunity to promote, at long last, a truly Jewish form of education. Seen from this perspective, it is easier to understand certain measures, measures taken by the leaders of Italian Jewish institutions. 
In July 1924, the president of the Consorzio, uh, Angelo Sereni, presented Mussolini with a memorandum that did not request the repeal or amendment of the Gentile reform, but rather the introduction of tax relief for Jewish schools, which despite financial and organizational difficulties, it hoped that individual communities would found to compensate for the consequences of the reform. The Consortium's memorandum recognized the need and importance of religious education for young pupils, implicitly embracing the same philosophy that had inspired the fascist reform. We consider it wise and useful to include religious instruction in childhood education, Sereni wrote to Mussolini. Spiritual instruction that contributes to shaping good citizens, end of quote. The consortium's initiatives did not lead to concrete results, however. And equally fruitless were the attempts by the chief rabbi of Rome, uh, Angelo Sacerdoti, to obtain certain amendments to the reform in 1924. And it is significant that here, again, the solution suggested by the rabbi was not the return to the previous state of affairs but to establish state funding for Jewish institutions. In their protest against a law that gave state institutions a strong religious bias, Jewish leaders were therefore suggesting that the school system be rendered completely denominational. Uh, the second step is, of course, uh, the Concordat. The signing of the Lateran Treaty February uh, 1929, between the Italian government and the Holy See, raised new concerns among Italian Jews. I quote, this is a very painful moment for us, end of quote, wrote Vice President of the Consortium of Felice Ravenna to its President Andrew Sereni on February 1920, on February 28. The treaty restored the state of Catholicism, the status of Catholicism and the sole state religion, and the concordat that accompanied it perfectly echoing with scholastic norms that had been in place since 1923, established, I quote, the teaching of Christian doctrine in the form as done by Catholic tradition as the foundation and crowning aim of the public education. And it was the editor-in-chief of Israel, uh, Alfonso Pacifici, who ventured to write an article after the concordat uh, it is called In Regime di Concordato, which appeared on February uh, 28, 1929. And this article was the only public examination of the topic by the Jewish press. The reflections of Israel's editor have, up to now, been interpreted as taking a firm, explicit stance of opposition to the church and the regime. But when read it in its entirety, however, the article does not all, at all reveal a critical slant. The directors open his remarks by saying that, I quote, the totalitarian nature of the modern state and the fascist one in particular make it possible for the state to remain completely extraneous to all manifestations of life related to the non-Catholic nature of a given group of citizens. End of quote. Implying a positive view of what fascists had done up to then, Pacifici continued, the manifestations seen uh, to date move in this direction. Under the new regime, for instance, the care taken by public schools to avoid scheduling exams on holidays has been more assiduous and, one would say, more spontaneous than in the past, which seems perfectly logical and understandable. Nor should there be any reason for this to change after the recent treaties, as Chivici optimistically concluded. And in another significant passage of this article, Pacifici speaks of the elective affinity between religious souls, whether Jewish or Catholic. Moreover, a frequent and pleasant experience in everyday life is the elective affinity that transcends all differences in creed, 
binding together those who are most disciplined and fervently faithful to the norms of their respective groups. Rarely will the highly regarded Jew, strongly observant of the Shabbat and other law, fail to have honest, honest friends who are good zealous Catholics. Their reciprocal friendship founded precisely on their shared pursuit of a disciplined and ardently conservative life. And the greater involvement of the state in religious matters, even those of minority faiths, should not be considered a troubling threat from which to defend oneself, therefore. In fact, Pacifici concluded, Sorry. We thus believe that a likely consequence of the concordat with regard to Jewish life will be a greater involvement, a lesser degree of agnosticism on the part of the state than in the past. Without going into details that would be premature, the facilitation of Jewish schooling for those parents who request it and recognition of Jewish wedding ceremonies for those who desire them seem plausible in light of these new norms. Achikichi's article, the only one that appeared in Jewish press, therefore seemed to take an optimistic view, considering the end of state agnosticism to be a positive development, even for the life of the minority. The third and final step is the so-called law on permitted denomination. Uh, which was passed a few months after the Concordat on June 24, 1929. Uh, the urgency of the provision uh, related from uh, the, resulted from the need after the treaty to update the norms on marriages performed by non-Catholic clergy. And more generally, this law reflected the, the government's desire to bring together regulatory elements that had been scattered through various legislation in a single day. The law, which seemed to clear the air of the fears that have de developed among minor minorities in previous years, stated that, I quote, religions other than uh, that of the Roman Catholic and Apostolic Church could be freely practiced. That difference of religions, of religion, does not constitute a barrier to enjoyment of all civil and political rights or to eligibility for civil and military posts, and that religious matters could be discussed in total freedom. Still, the, net, the text delegated brought powers to the government to issue concrete regulations at a later point for the implementation of the law. And this led to the decree of February 28, 1930 which would severely curtail the liberal provisions of the law passed the previous June. Stringent, invasive uh, police inspections were introduced, police inspections were introduced, clearly aimed at reducing proselytization by minority religions, a concern that for fascists principally regarding the Protestant world, of course, and freedom of worship was limited. Uh, to open new houses of worship, um, it was necessary to obtain authorization by royal decree, and only religious meetings uh, presided over um, by a minister, whose appointment had to be approved by the Minister of the Interior, could be held without requesting prior authorization. For an appointment to be approved, the minister had to be a citizen and no Italian and no Italian. Non-Catholic ministers were not allowed any of the prerogatives that the Concordat granted to Catholic clergy. Lastly, the state reserved the right to visit, inspect, and dissolve the internal administrative bodies of non-Catholic religious entities and to reverse their decisions. The decree went almost unnoticed in the Jewish press. The columns of Israel contained only an article by Jewish law scholar Mario Falco um, that illustrates it in a neutral tone but without concealing any of their limitations the contents of the new decree. As on other occasions, this article was not followed up 
with any editorial commentary and did not lead to any further discussion in the Jewish press. The decree of February 1930, although it contained provisions that seriously diminished the previous liberties, introducing significant government intrusion and disparity of treatment, was welcomed with considerable satisfaction by the Jewish institutional elites. A consortium document of December 29, 1929, even called the text of the future decree of which the consortium had obtained a preview from government sources, I quote, of an unhoped for latitude, end of quote, and deemed that government had incorporated, I quote, many of the wishes expressed in this regard by the consortium. End of quote. I will now come to my conclusions. Taken as a whole, the initiatives and discussions on the part of Italian Jewish institutional leaders and the Jewish press regarding the religious policies of fascists seem to lack any line of reflection that would lead them, in view of the disturbing turn in political events, to question the past, present, and future of their status as a recently emancipated minority. The fear of fascist censorship made it risky to take an explicit stance, of course, which naturally helps uh, explain this timidity, this silence. But still, I think that the response we see here is not just a cautious one due to fear of censorship. In my opinion, we must ask ourselves whether the religious policies of fascism were really experienced and perceived by a portion of the Jewish elite as threatening to their own precarious status as a minority. The questions remain one of understanding whether liberal values were truly shared, whether they actually became part of the culture of the Italian Jewish minority or rather of its institutional and cultural elites, or whether they were looked on doubtful, doubtfully by those who should have been the first to adopt them. Some clues do allow us to glimpse an attitude that is not always critical of certain ideas that fascists promoted and carried out. For instance, the strong emphasis placed by the regime of religious feeling and identity as elements characterizing the new fascist nation, the ideological hub around which the ecclesiastical uh, policies of the Trentis were conceived and justified, could resonate to some degree with desire to rekindle Jewish identity and spirituality, generating a synaptic leap that hindered a more critical reflection on the present and made it impossible to grasp the deeper dangers lurking in fascist religious measures. What do I mean by this? I mean that Italian Jewish institutional and cultural, elites, the cultural leaders were primarily occupied with struggling against the consequences of assimilation, which in their eyes was irredeemably breaking apart the community. The rewaking of Jewish identity that they hoped for could only come, up, come about through a religious um, reawakening in which education played a fundamental part. It is in this sense that, as I try to illustrate by some of the citation, citations I've highlighted, the religious policies of fascists definitely represented a threat for the minority, but also, paradoxically, were seen as an example and a model to be followed, as a way of promoting the reconstruction of Jewish identity that they so hoped for. It was once again the editor-in-chief of Israel, Alfonso Pacifici, who in 1932, on the front page of the weekly Israel, celebrated the 10th anniversary of the March on Rome and Mussolini's seizure of power. Even aside from the natural rhetoric of the occasion, Pacifici's words expressed quite a positive view of the new cultural and religious climate brought about by fascism. Pacifici wrote, after 10 years under the fascist regime, the spiritual rhythm of Jewish life in Italy is more intense, much more intense than before. 
cultural initiatives have become more numerous, better coordinated, more serious, and the interest in the historical and ideological underpinnings of contemporary Jewish life has grown keener. None of this should come as a surprise. Rather, one would be surprised were it not so. It is also proof that in a historical climate such as fascism, it is much easier, easier for the forgetful to return to the path of conscience and for the mindful to strengthen it. In the end, the spiritual and religious rebirth of the Italian nation promoted by fascism do seem to have a positive reverberation on the potential reconstruction of Jewish identity, which emancipation in some circles, in some Jewish circles, completely <coughs> identified with assimilation, had weakened and which, at least for Italian Jewish institutional and cultural elites of the period, remained the primary objective. Thank you. very interesting and challenging presentation. And uh, now please welcome Elena Hatzi, who is uh, presenting a paper entitled The Longest Decade, Church and Fascism Under the Concordat. Thank you, Natalia and Alessandro Cassin, first of all. Uh, I'm very proud uh, of, um, of um, being here. And um, I'm uh, last speaker, so uh, probably I repeat uh, some things uh, that you also uh, already uh, listened. OK. Uh, I have no slide. Uh, and, uh, I read the paper. Um, the decade. No, 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 no. Okay, it's okay. Um, the decade which followed the signing of Concord that, uh, and the letter and pact and uh, ended uh, with the death of um, Pius XI, uh, February 10th, 1939, witnessed a series of uh, events which shed light on the real objectives pursued both by the fascist regime and the Vatican in finding political and religious areas of agreement. In that decade, there were also the most significant conflicts which marked a progressive antagonism between Pius XI and Mussolini. Through a study of the Italian Catholic press and material from the secret Vatican archives, this paper will try to explain and uh, synthesize uh, too many issues that uh, um, I, I study in, um, you know, for our research uh, um, more large than uh, this paper. The first, uh, is linked, uh, um, the first issue is linked uh, with the study of the propaganda which uh, the Italian church, uh, uh, together with um, its episcopacy, promoted a more the faithful to present the concordat as the moment when the throne altar alliance could be said to have been completely realized, throne altar alliance. The second issue concerns one aspect of state antisemitism introduced, as we know, by the fascist regime in 1938 related to the law of November 17, 1938, which undermined the rights sanctioned by the Concordat with regard to mixed marriages and the children of these marriages. Um, thus, the different interpretation of uh, the Concordat by the two parties became increasingly clear in this uh, decade, uh, in my opinion, but uh, many uh, different interpretations. For fascism, it was to be uh, the beginning of a progressive and complete fascistization of the church. For the church, instead, uh, the Concordat constituted the first step towards the Catholicization of fascism and therefore of the whole of the Italian society. Uh, Science of the drawing up of the Concordat, relations uh, between fascism and the Catholic Church were based uh, 
on a misunderstanding is a, a sort of euphemism. Each side uh, thought uh, it could use and exploit the other for its own, own ends. Mussolini, for example, in, in uh, his speech to the Chamber of Deputies in uh, 30 May, uh, May 1929, stressed above all uh, the fact that uh, through the signing of the treaty, the fascist uh, state had succeeded where the liberal one had always failed. The drawing up of the Concordat had only been, in his view, the necessary, but after all, not very heavy price to pay to arrive at the solution of the so-called Roman question. For his part, Pius XI, today after the signing of the Concordat and the treaty, stated, stated his uh, point of view in addressing professors and students of the University of Sacred Heart of Milan. He said that on this occasion, uh, is, is, um, this is a very, very known speech, but uh, I, I quote uh, uh, from uh, Pius XI. Um, Therefore, the conditions of religion in Italy could not be regulated without a previous agreement between the two powers, a previous agreement opposed by the condition of the church in Italy. Therefore, to make a way for the treaty, the condition had to be restored. Why? It was necessary to have the concordat in order to restore the condition themselves. The solution, uh, continued uh, by Yusilevan, was not easily attained, but we must thank the Lord for having shown it to us and also to others. The solution was to carry forward the two things peri pesu. We have to say that we were also nobly supported by the other side. And perhaps it was also necessary that there should be a man like the one providence made us encounter. A man who was not bordered by the concerts of the liberal school and, the and, and by the grace of God, uh, of God, with a lot, uh, with a lot of patience, with a lot of work, we have we have succeeded in concluding a concordat, which, if it is not the best possible one, it, uh, it is certainly among the best which have been made until now, and it is with deep satisfaction that through it we have given God back to Italy, and Italy to God, and of course. And this, this article um, were published uh, um, on Italian Catholic Press and uh, uh, on Osservatore Romano on Olysses uh, um, official newspaper. Uh, the drawing up of the, the Lateran, um, of the Lateran Pacts effect, eff effectively increased the, the acceptance of, of the fascist regime by the Church and Catholics. The propaganda which I had accompanied the regime from the outset became in the 30s a real factory of consensus aiming at the fascistization of the country through all the modern means of mass communications which were available at the time. On the part of the, of the Catholics, the support for the regime was part uh, of a long history of the, mentality, of the mentality which had influenced and indoctrinated them since the French Revolution. In fact, from the time of the Revolution, the Catholic, the Catholic world had responded to the processes of secularization with the proposal of returning to a Christian society. Generally speaking, this perspective was rooted, deeply rooted, in the uh, conception that the church, in a month as it was a perfect society, constituted a model for every human society which wanted to be truly civilized. This conviction was linked with the thesis that the medieval uh, Christianity model with its integral subordination of all of the aspects of a person's life to religion's ends, had represented this model, medieval model, had represented the closest historical realization of the ideal of Christian civilization. Hence, intransigent thought found its natural outlet in favoring regimes like that of Mussolini, but also towards Hitler, deeply anti-liberal, anti-communist, and with a strong totalitarian orientation. 
and on this uh, huge topic, uh, um, uh, Giovanni Miccoli and Daniele Menozzi wrote uh, a beautiful and very sophisticated uh, um, um, books. And I refer to, to, to this book. Um, Other fascist studies could, uh, could uh, end up by threatening the wide ranging autonomy the church had in Ah, sorry. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Um, although fascist uh, statism could uh, end up by threatening the wide-ranging autonomy the church uh, had succeeded uh, in obtaining with the conquered at uh, political logic tended to extend uh, to the action of the fascist regime the legitimization of the church hierarchy. It was particularly true at the time of the campaign in Africa in which uh, the fascist imperialist and colonial colonial spirit was compounded by the church's missionary legitimization. And at the, at the time of the Spanish Civil War, when the state church alliance was, if anything, even closer because of the common authoritarian and anti-Bolshevik bond. But the, um, this was also true regarding other measures which could not fail to meet with the approval of the, cl the clergy, such as uh, the incentives uh, to increase the, the birth rate, the rural policy, and the campaign against uh, urbanizations. And, uh, without this, some recently published works uh, I, I referred to Lucia Cecchi's uh, books uh, in particular have highlighted uh, the, these aspects for the clergy's consensus uh, with regard to fascism uh, during the campaign, as well as the clergy's patriotic fervor both with respect to the useless wars and events of a social significance like the day of the mother and child, the pilgrimage to Rome of prolific mothers or the settlement of the reclaimed marshes uh, near to, to Rome, the Agropontino. Um, in no way, according to Duse, did the, the signing of the Concordat mean that the church was entitled to interfere in the country's civil and social life. The state had not announced its full sovereignty in any sector. For, pa uh, for Pius XI and for the Italian church, what counted was having succeeded thanks to Concordat, inflicted a decisive blow against the principle of the secular status of the state. Pius XI admitted that only the encounter with an enemy of liberalism like Mussolini had made, the, made it possible to arrive at such a result. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you. Anyway, um, the organization of the Catholic laity. It was, in fact, the only non-fascist association whose members could meet freely, almost freely. For um, fascism, therefore, it represented a kind of island, oasis, uh, or free port, which eluded the ambition of totalitarian control over every aspect of the nation's life. Furthermore, Catholic action was mainly concerned with the education of the young and so represented a dangerous rival with respect to the regime's educational organizations. The clash of 1931, which was extremely bitter, witnessed on the, uh, on, on, on the one hand the destruction of the various premises of Catholic uh, educational clubs and on the other hand, the papacy's very firm stand determined not to lose the main channel of communication between the ecclesiastical hierarchy and the masses. On December 30, 1931, in any case, an agreement was reached. reached. Catholic action uh, would pursue strictly religious aims, uh, abstaining from every political activity, but could uh, freely pursue the education of young Catholics. The second clash between the church and the regime began 
in 1957 when Pius XI issued the encyclical against the religious persecution in Nazi uh, Germany and against the, 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 the the racism, the Nazi uh, racism, uh, meet Brennan de Sorge, Sorge, already mentioned uh, during this day, uh, together, um, uh, together with uh, two other encyclicals, one against uh, atheistic uh, communism, Divinio Redemptoris, the other about the Mexican question, Firmissima Constantia. Mit Brennan der Sorge fully reflected the uh, Pope's uh, theological approach, uh, which uh, uh, already combined the, the idea of humanity's salvation only through faith in Christ, in the, church, in the church and in the ecclesiastical hierarchy, with a very strong opposition to all the, those secular and liberal currents which reduced uh, the religious com component to an individual and private profession of faith. On the basis of this anti-liberal vision and anti-modern, uh, Ratti, uh, Pius XI, had, as is known, welcomed, uh, welcomed the drawing up of the concordats with the totalitarian regimes such as uh, mentioned fascism and national, national socialism as these agreements sanctioned. Nevertheless, Pius XI firmly condemned both the racist doctrines and the myth of the Aryan race, such as theorized by uh, the Nazi regimes over the past years, which the Pope defined the uh, myth of the Aryan race as a new form of uh, a dangerous paganism. I uh, from Pius XI. These pontifical positions against the German ally provoked a strong reaction in Mussolini, who publicly expressed his disappointment in several occasions, accusing the Pope of interfering with a political field out of his competence. However, during 1937 and 1938, the conflict between the Church and the Nazi regime was confined to the Reich's attacks uh, against the rights of German Catholics. With regard to the anti-Jewish persecution already underway in Germany over the past few years, it did not uh, seem necessary to Pius XI or the Italian um, Catholic public opinion to express any, any opinion, any word. Thus, uh, the, the, thus uh, the, um, there was a lack, a lack of full understanding of the liberticidal policy of Nazism, whose aspiration was not so much that of only expanding, expanding the church from the body of the nation, as, uh, um, as that of progressively widening the discriminating horizon to include the hand human groups whose values and beliefs were considered an, ob an, ob an obstacle to the achievement of the purity and the racial unity of the German people. In the face of a fascist racist policy, the attitude of the Holy See and the Italian Church was much more complex and vague than mm, their attitude to Nazi racism. After all, this ambiguity is not very surprising, considering the dominant role conferred to the Church by the, uh, by the, the Latin Pacts, a condition of a privilege which impelled the Holy See to seek in 1938 a series of compromises and adjustments which would not contravene the principle of the, of the Catholic morality, not disturb the juridical poly, political setup sanctioned by the conciliation. Even though, from the, uh, even, even though from the beginning of the 1938 the regime had begun to indicate uh, its intention of discriminating against foreign Jews resident in Italy, the reaction to the publication of the Manifesto of the Racist Scientist in July 1938 meant that neither the Church nor Catholic public opinion could avoid the commenting on the document and its content clearly formulated in racist terms. Nevertheless, the introduction of the racist and anti-Semitic legislation encountered a limited condemnation on the part, only, only on the part, of the Italian bishops and the Catholic press, while in some cases it was even open, openly applauded. Um, for instance, Agostini Gemelli. It's a very model of clerical fascism. Not, uh, not, however, by Pius XI, uh, who, as you know, during an audience, 
granted to the pilgrims of the Belgian Catholic region on September 6, 1938, um, said, uh, I quote, uh, it's, a very, it's a very famous uh, um, speech, but uh, uh, listen carefully. Uh, Abraham is defined as our patriarch, our ancestor. Anti-Semitism is an odious movement. We Christians must have nothing to do with it. With it. Anti-Semitism is inadmissible. Spiritually, we are Semites. The message was reported by the French and Belgian Catholic press, but not the, by the Osservatorio Romano, the only, appunto, only is the official newspapers, or Italian Catholic newspapers. The day before that the audience, uh, in September 5, 9, uh, 5, 1938, the regime has introduced the first of the racial law relating the measures for the defense of the race in the school, which sanctioned the adoption of the state anti-Semitism on the part of fascist Italy. I like the Pope's word for the Belgian pilgrims, and in other circumstances, the ecclesiastical protest about the introduction of the racial law in Italy was limited, limited, limited to a denunciation of the breach of the concordat regarding mixed marriages. A month later, on October 6, 1938, the regime voted through the Declaration of Race, in which, among other measures, there was a ban on marriage, uh, marriages of Italian men and Italian women with person of the uh, Hamite, Kamita, Hamite, uh, Semite and other non-Aryan races. The evening of the same day, the Apostolic Nuncio uh, often, uh, often. Uh, uh, mentioned during this, uh, this conference. Um, in the, um, the evening uh, um, of the same day, the Apostolic Crucial to the Italian government, Francesco Borgoncini Duca, met the Foreign Minister Galeazzo Ciano in order to clarify the regime's position regarding marriages. Two uh, typewritten notes um, kept at Vatican Secret Archive uh, that I studied uh, together um, uh, another many scholars, drawn up by the Nuncio for the foreign minister and then sent to Mussolini, had already been written on the evening of 6 October 1938. In the first, in the first of the two notes, the Nuncio, uh, the Borgoncini Duca commented, the Grand Council in the session of 6 October came close to accepting, accepting these ideas, stating that a person born from, from a mixed marriage if he professes another religion apart from the Jewish one uh, on 1st October 1938 is not considered as belonging to the Jewish race. It is not clear, wrote Borgoncini Duca, however, why the limitation of a date was added as a Jew who had abjured the Mosaic religion would no longer be part of the Jewish nation and people, even if this had happened after 1st October 1938. Consequences, uh, wrote the Nuncio, one cannot, uh, in fact, consider as belonging to the Jewish people a person whom the Jews, the Jews themselves do not consider to be part of it. It is therefore necessary that uh, the converts to Catholicism should not be included among the Jews. The former convert have had the courage and the heroism to break away from their nation of origin by abjuring Mosaism. If instead they were to be considered real Jews by Italian law, they would find themselves in a worse condition than the Jews themselves, let alone the affront uh, to the Catholic Church, which has united them with its own flock, end of quote, uh, of the first typewritten, um, typewritten um, um, of a new show. In the second note, uh, Borgoncini Duca explained how the conflict between the church and the regime would have developed uh, if the latter had not corrected the part of the draft <coughs> of the law which was at variance uh, with the, the 929 uh, uh, nine, um, accords. I wrote uh, uh, 
Borgoncini Duca. With the ban on marriages between Italian citizens and a person belonging to the Hamite, the Semite, and other non <coughs> races, there will develop a conflict of principle and practice between the Italian state and the Catholic Church uh, regarding Article 34 of the Concordat. The Church cannot uh, uh, forbid uh, uh, a marriage uh, uh, between two Catholics of uh, whatever race or nationality. This is a uh, uh, divine law, end of quote. In parallel with Borgoncini, Borgoncini Duca's interpretation, also Tacchi Venturi, uh, as uh, Fabri uh, said before me, also um, Father Tacchi Venturi was focus, uh, um, focusing his efforts on reaching an agreement between the Vatican and the regime about the issue of the converts, um, which would not harm the church. Uh, during the negotiations, uh, the Holy See only managed to assert its request for the suppression of the Article 7 of the Bill about concubinage, but it failed in its attempt to gain legal recogni recognition for marriages between converted Jews and Catholic spouses after uh, 1st of, of October 1938. Uh, uh, Pius XI uh, uh, declared that uh, these violated uh, Article 34 of the Concordat and wrote to Mussolini and the King, Vittorio Emanuele III, III explaining the regime's uh, violation with regard to matrimonial matters. On November th uh, 13, the Holy See delivered to the Italian Embassy an official note of protest. This note was followed the next day by an article in uh, published in the um, Osservatorio Romano uh, entitled uh, Regarding a New Law by Decree, which summarized the contents of the note that I, uh, I read uh, before. Uh, despite this effort by the, church, uh, uh, by the church to correct a law considered, uh, first of all, um, uh, for all its other anti-Semitic aspects acceptable, the regime did not change the text of Article 6 uh, relate, uh, relating to mixed marriages. And on November 17, 1938, it issued the royal law by decree measure for the defense of their Italian race. As regards Pius XI, he did not attenuate the tone or content of his public speech and in the following months he dealt with the issue of mixed marriages on various, uh, on various occasions. For, uh, for example, in this speech delivered in front of uh, the Cardinals on Christmas Eve 1938, he declared that his soul was distressed not only by the issue of Catholic action, uh, action uh, under attacks in this, uh, in this year, but also by the government's re recent legislative measures. In totally unambiguous terms, Ratti denounced the regime's violation on the rights sanctioned by the conciliation. He said, I quote, the affront, uh, the wound inflicted to our concordat is precisely, precisely in what touches unholy matrimony, which for every Catholic means a great deal. We don't, need, uh, we, don't not, uh, we don't not need to add a single word to this simple statement in order to say that very painful wound has gone straight to our earth. We know that it, it continue by yourself. We know that it, uh, it, uh, um, it has been said that, that the concordat has not been violated in any way, but has remained unscathed. This point is for every bilateral pact and for its observance, its interpretation cannot be usurped by one side. This applies even more to such a crucial interpretation which exempts one side from every commitment. Uh, end of quote. The fascist regime's attack against the 1929 Concordat, together with the adoption of measures uh, restricting the, the church's free exercise as regard baptism and marriages, and the four as regard religious policies, laid the foundation for a growing clash, growing clash between the, the ecclesiastical institution or better, uh, between Pius XI and the regime. A conflict 
destined nevertheless to attenuate itself as a result of, of two events. The death of Pius XI and the election uh, to the papacy of the much more diplomatic and prudent um, Eugenio Pacelli, who put above all else the defense of the Concordat and therefore of the privileges of the Church and the Holy See at the expense of other issues, first of all, that of the converts and more generally that of the regime and semantic persecutions. Thank you. Thank you, Elena Mazzini. I'll ask Radio Radan to join us so that uh, we still have time for a few questions. We have mics here. Does someone have the audience mic? Yeah. I think we have a question in the back. Hi. A question for Hilaria uh, Pan. Uh, I would like to know if you think that the Pacific attitude towards uh, fascist policies, uh, fascist political policies, uh, are something related to um, his idea, his uh, Zionism, his idea of, of a future Israel in, uh, and its uh, political order. Yeah. Okay. Um, <clears throat> no, I don't think that directly uh, the attitude of Pacifici is linked with his personal uh, standpoint about uh, Zionism, uh, although it is indirectly, I think, related to it. I think is the origins uh, of Pacifici's attitude is in uh, is pre-war. Um, uh, writings um, in which Pacifici expressed um, a, nas a nationalistic I would say this I, we can use this word naturali nationalistic um, standpoint uh, in which uh, Italian nationalistic or Jewish? No, Jewish, sorry Jewish nationalistic uh, standpoint in which the ethnicity and the religious spirit of Judaism was central, was crucial. And so um, uh, some of his courts, I don't know if I can say that, uh, resounded uh, when uh, Mussolini issued his fascist policies. I think it was more uh, related to his pre-war Jewish national nationalism that continued uh, over the 20s and over the 30s. Uh, Pacifici left Italy in 1924 to uh, settle down in, uh, in Palestine. And yeah. became uh, um, even more nat nationalistic in Israel. I have a question uh, on the first part, oh, on your first point. Uh, educated reaction to the educational reform in 1923. I would like to remember that on the first page of the Israel on uh, September the 17th, 1923, Angelo Sacerdoti, chief rabbi of Rome, wrote an article entitled A Cry of Alarm, in which he um, made a provision. Uh, he, he wrote that uh, it's advisable to, uh, to, to, to believe that uh, within not many years, Jews were prohibited to teach in the public schools. Uh, there, there was also in 1925, during the, the, the debate in Senate, the, the public address of senator Vittorio Polacco, the jurist Vittorio uh, Polacco, uh, which was also published uh, yes, it was published on the in Israel. 19, before uh, he, he died in 1926, uh, the, 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 um, 
he, he wrote uh, for the liberty of conscience and the, and the, um, and the protection of religious minorities. He uh, went on to uh, de define the attack on Jewish Polacco. Yes, Polacco, which was a, who was a senator and so a, a, a representative uh, uh, personality, a, a Jewish representative personality. Um, he compared the, the 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 attack on Jewish uh, on on the, the rights of, of uh, religious minority to a moral pogrom. And uh, in the, the reactions of uh, Sacerdoti and Polacco was well mentioned in the American Jewish Yearbook uh, in the annual report uh, on the situation of Jews in all over the world. Uh, so I think that some reaction, uh, Professor Benvenuto Terracini, uh, a professor in the University of Turin uh, on the Israel in um, on June 20, the 28th, 1923, uh, was frightened that in the new elementary school, Italian elementary school, uh, Jew, uh, Jewish uh, pupils and Jewish teachers are not uh, at home. And so some reactions, perhaps, uh, there were the the reactions. No, no, the, uh, the problem of education was a real concern. Uh, Jewish leaders were extremely worried about the consequences of Gentile's reform. That's, that's no doubt about it. And the problem is, what can we do to, um, to protect ourselves as a minority? And their answer was, we have to completely created a Jewish uh, institution, educational institution. We do not have to come back to the liberal state and to the uh, secularism of the liberal state. Vittorio Polacco, in fact, in, in his speech, uh, wrote something very different from Sacerdoti, from Lattes, from Pacifici. He said that once we were uh, lucky when there was the liberal state. And we were permitted to be Jews and Italians as well, without being these two categories conflicting with each other. Polacco uh, claimed for a return to the liberal principles. Sacerdoti, Lattes, Pacifici, they were going to ask for something different, which was not the liberal state, but a confessional state in which even the Jews could be protected. But it's a very different way of, of, uh, of seeing uh, the status of a minority. And of course, is determined and, uh, by the context, of course. But what they wanted, what they asked for, was not the return to the liberal principle. They were, of course, extremely concerned and worried. And this uh, concern about the education uh, was, uh, went on during the following years. Just to follow up on this, uh, one thing that your presentation brought to mind, of course, is the debates in the Jewish community in the mid-19th century about de mm -hmm. And there were rabbis, certainly at the time, who were opposed to mm -hmm. liberation from the ghetto for exactly the same reasons, basically. So that kind of fear, that kind of anti-liberalism, you see now new echoes of. The other thing I think you see new echoes of, that I've spent too much time looking at people states, but is the toadying up to power. You know, the Pope is wonderful, merciful, always been you know, terrific to the Jews. Um, so there's a kind of a narrative uh, pattern here uh, that then gets repeated. It's not that long after 1870 in the end of the, the Roman ghetto, albeit you're referring to uh, more northern uh, Jews. Uh, and the other thing that could be said is the fears that these people had uh, were not unfounded. That in fact, there was uh, a threat to their old way of life through the loss of Jews to assimilation, 
there's a huge or very, very significant uh, proportion of Jews who are going to be baptized over the next uh, a couple of decades. And uh, the Jewish community is going to be diminished and diminished, except for the you know, later immigration. So this is, I think, one of the ironies of this situation. Yes, I totally agree with your analysis. It's part of the more general framework in which this history has to be. Thank you. Um, two little questions and two little ideas. Um, Ilaria uh, Vavan, uh, what about La Nostra Bandiera? And uh, Elena Mazzini, I think it will be very interesting to analyze the jurisprudence of Corte di Cassazione on the things you studies. Analyze the, 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 the ideas of the Cassazione judges, because in the Cassazione during the fascist period, there are many, many old liberals and some Catholic Jews, Jewish judges. And I think it would be interesting in the framework of your report. And two little ideas for new colloquium. Uh, fascist policy on religious minorities in the Italian colonies. Because it's very interesting the attitude of Mussolini again, the Coptic Church and Islam. And another idea, fascist policy on status of, of minorities, not only religious, in the society of nations. It is there in the archive of the society of nations, there are many documents related with the Italian uh, positions on the status of minorities after the First World War. It's a big problem. Hmm? I think this for next meeting uh, will be in time because it's not very status, this two things. Thank you. You mean the figure of Umberto Zanotti Bianco, for example? Yeah. Um, as to uh, La Nostra Bandiera, I have stopped my paper to 1930 because I think that after the Falco Law, 1930, 1931, situation changed completely uh, for the Jews and in the relationship between Jews and uh, the regime. So I didn't analyze what happened after that. Uh, La Nostra Bandiera was a fascist and Jewish, uh, monthly yeah. or Month. weekly, I, I don't remember. Biweekly. Biweekly a paper, um, which uh, tried to combine the very deeply fascist faith with the very deeply Jewish faith of their editors. Um, for many years, uh, La Nostra Bandiera has been judged as a, uh, only a pro-fascist paper, and that was true, of course, but it was um, also a very Jewish paper with the religious discussions, and the Bandieristi didn't want it to reject it, their Jewish identity, or renounce to their Jewish identity, but they wanted to combine it with their national, national and fascist they thought that it was possible to combine it. Uh, thank you. I am going to follow your suggestion. <laughs> and and um, uh, about the uh, Bandera movement, uh, there's a uh, Michel probably correct me uh, only one uh, book about it. Um, written by uh, Luca Ventura and uh, published in um, yeah. 2000, <laughs> no, 
six years ago. Six years ago. Okay, six years ago, and uh, it's a, a literary construction. But uh, are you interesting in this? Uh, I don't know. It's a <laughs> no, because it's a, in, no, no publication uh, in Italy. Uh, in, there's no pu publication of, of movement. Most of Algeria. There are no studies. Yeah. Publications. And, uh, until the thirties, there were only two Jewish press in Italy. Um, Jewish, Jewish papers. Uh, the weekly, the Israel, and from 1925 onward, the Rasenia Mansilla de Israel, mm -hmm. uh, which was the cultural appendix, appendix of the Israel. But after 1930, uh, we have uh, the Var, the Nostra Bandiera, so the, um, the scenario of Jewish press was uh, from 1925. Ah, yes. The Var, the Nostra Bandiera, the Bollettino della Comunità di Roma. The uh, the the so uh, the scenario of Jewish press uh, was much more complete and different and heterogeneous, yeah. testifying that uh, the Jewish world was not unique. There were many voices inside the Jewish world and uh, with different perspective, and I think that's interesting to stress it. Uh, uh, we do not have studies on the, uh, the ruling class, uh, the elites of Italian Jewry. We do not have it at all. So it's, it, it's very difficult to, to go forward in this kind of uh, examination and, uh, and reflection. Uh, in the 20s, all the power is in the hand, as uh, Ilaria told, of uh, Israel and the religious and the uh, Zionist and the Hebrew integrali. In, I, I don't know how to translate integral Jews. It's very complicated. Uh, we, it's very difficult to um, to under to comprehend which if there was difference between people like men, like Felice Ravenna, and obviously Mario Falco, and the other group, Pacifici, Lattes, the Sacerdoti, the young Enzo Sereni that I discovered with the cool disposition. It's very difficult to, uh, in, in the first two decades, Italian jury gave, uh, we can, I can use the word, Gave, but it's more simple. Many men, many people to the Italian state and to the Italian parties, Luigi Luzzatti or in the Socialist Party, Modigliani and Treves or the Sindacalista Rivoluzionario Angelo Olivier Olivetti or the Corporativista Gino Arias. We do not have the same number of uh, uh, personality, not Zionist, not uh, real religious, in the uh, ruling class, in, 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 in the vertice, at the, as chief of the communities. So I don't know if you, if you have been able to make a distinction between the area, that's not a, a monolithic area, Pacifici, Lattes, Sacerdoti, and the area uh, Ravenna Falco? No, I'm not able <laughs> yet. Um, what the documents revealed, um, reveals um, is that the consortium was mainly um, in the hands of Sereni e Ravenna. Sulam um, Angelo Sereni, the Angelo father, Sereni, the father of Enzo, uh, <laughs> yes. and Felice Lavenna. Uh, um, <clears throat> the correspondence between them is very rich. They practically daily correspond uh, about all the problems of the Italian Jews. 
uh, Angelo uh, Sulam was mm, in, the, in the back, uh, how can I say? Back. To the uh, backstage, yes. Uh, after 1930, situation changed, and I didn't uh, examine it. Um, what I know is that the archives of the Consortio and the Unione of the Jewish Community in Italy are extremely rich, uh, and someone has to study it. <laughs> because especially for the 30s, there are a lot of documentation about colonialism, uh, about the war of Spain, the war of Ethiopia, and you can say how the fascistization of the Jewish community uh, of the Italian Jewish community uh, was a success. I think this, this is a strong point. I mean, I was wondering if, for instance, the documents of the Congress, of the, the Jewish Congress, the Congress of Livorno, we, we, I mean, Modigliani by this time was in France already, because he lives in 1924. I mean, there are a number of figures, especially Jews who are socialist, who were already really marginalized. Um, I think the speech of Nello Rosselli, the famous speech, it refers to, in some ways, to these issues within the context of the Congress, uh, the Jewish Congress, and it's 24, Four. right? Four. So, um, I mean, it, it's a very, again, it's a very variegated uh, scene, and uh, certainly this study seems is very, it's very important as a base to. Of course, it's very partial. I admitted it at the beginning of my paper. It's only an angle. That's not all yeah. Jewish mm -hmm. world, absolutely. Now, on the other hand, I think that the study of the Jewish leadership also yes, goes, Jewish leads Jewish us to understand Jewish better Jewish how the Jewish leadership that yeah. remained yeah. and yeah. remained um, in some degree functional uh, after the Russian laws um, found itself shrunk mm -hmm. in, in ways that are very different context, but not so different principle from that of all Jewish leaderships under uh, Nazi rules. I mean, when we talk about the issues that the uh, elders of uh, Theresienstadt faced, which were extreme, uh, you know, issues that are in the same realm. I mean, they're, they're faced with the same uh, um, poverty of choices. Uh, in Italy in 1943, you know, after the armistice. So uh, I think that in this sense, it's something that is a, is a wide field that needs uh, further study. We have a Frank Adler. This is for Eulalia, uh, and also to Michele Slavati's question about Jewish elites. And I'm sure there's a diversity of response regionally. Uh, I seem to remember you wrote a book about Ferrara mm -hmm. and the Jewish mayor of Ferrara and you were working on Jewish elites in a way so I'm wondering if that's a lens through which you might comment what's going on as things change during the 1930s. As to Ferrara, I didn't study the Jewish community as a, an institution, I just studied the mayor, the Jewish mayor, so, and he didn't have any contact <laughs> with the Jewish community, so I can't say anything. But, but even informally, through Bassani and other people who, through informal social connections, must have been reacting to changes? No? Uh, what changes? The, the changes after uh, the Falco Law? Or? Well, during the 30s, uh, there are a number of uh, events to react to. Uh, uh, well, I, I didn't you know, examine it. Even the attempt in, in no, ending, just, ending his position is put I, but that's I the, only begin to uh, examine the files of the 20s and of the 30s. I know something, because while I was <laughs> examining the 20s, the eyes, <laughs> and for example, Mm, there, there are um, for the 1930-1937 a very interesting uh, documentation about the <coughs> participation of Italian Jewish leadership and Italian Jewish communities to the Ethiopian war, to the efforts, to the fascist effort to the, to the war. 
which is incredible. I mean, if you read the speeches of the rabbis, the Italian rabbis, in 1935 and 1936, you are, they were completely pro-fascist. Mm -hmm. uh, they, they did their speeches from the synagogue uh, for uh, supporting uh, the troops. Uh, they were completely fascist -ized. And the, the, even though we are so close to the 1938, less than two years, but uh, the Jewish leaders, the Jewish rabbi, the rabbis, seem not to see what was coming. Uh, not to realize. I have a question for Elijah, yes. Did there uh, never appear um, the problem of Palestine in relation with the Vatican? Papers, I mean, uh, no, but I'm not sure this is a definitive answer. <laughs> yes. I didn't see anything like this. Yes. I, I saw only that the, um, the conflicts of 1928 and 1929 with the Mussolini, uh, with these two articles appeared on the Popolo di Roma and on La Tribuna, were directly connected with Pacifici and with his pro Zionism. It was a problem, and it was a problem for Sereni and Ravenna too, who tried to put him aside, <laughs> but they failed. No, no, I, I, no, I, 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 I was meaning uh, about Palestine uh, as uh, the place where uh, uh, Jesus Christ. Uh, no, I, I didn't see anything, but, but um, that's not me, and that there isn't uh, anything about it. My question is to both of you, which is, are there comments in the Jewish press and Jewish communities in Italy at this time, especially after 1933, about observations of what is happening to Jews yes. in Germany? Yes. And are they, are they you know, because on one hand you say that they're still supporting the expansion of Italian fascism in the colonies, but are they beginning to discuss what could happen to them, how this could play out in Italy? And are they there for them? Are there any movements to emigrate to early, to beat the rush, if you will, to get out early? I mean, how are they responding to this? Um, I have in mind um, the articles that appeared in the Rassegna Pensile di Israel. Um, there were, not, not maybe to tell the truth, but anyway, there were um, some articles um, presenting. Uh, the Italian uh, Risorgimento, uh, some documents has the Dazzeglio, um, um, famous speech about emancipation, or uh, the other one, um, Tomaseo, uh, Nicola Tomaseo speech in uh, Trieste. And in the introduction um, of these uh, reprinted speeches, uh, the editorial board, it is, there is no sign under this introduction, um, said that we are lucky, we have this, we have this process, we have a very lucky scenario here in Italy, but in Germany the Jews are uh, experienced uh, so uh, a tremendous, uh, uh, a very, very bad, is, bad, bad time. So the comparison is interesting because they are aware that as Italians they are lucky. That's the way in which the German parallelism uh, appeared in uh, the Jewish press. I, I just would like to add a speculation on this. Uh, in 1933, the Union of the Italian Jewish Community created the first incarnation of the Comasevit, the Committee for Assistance to German Jewish Immigrants which is an enormous effort and is supported by the Joint Distribution Committee. Now, the joint, in the documents of the joint, there is a very, very strong pressure on the Italian Jewish communities uh, to portray fascism as uh, the last anchor, the last possibility for European Jewry to 
think, not to fall into the war. I mean, the, 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 among the totalitarian regimes, the one that will not really turn against the Jews. <laughs> Um, and the pressure, part of the reason of the pressure is that uh, Italy was uh, the actual physical point of exit for European Jews and all the bases that, besides Lisbon, which was not very practical, otherwise were Genoa, Trieste, and Fiume. Uh, so the Jewish leadership has, I think, is very sensitive to this and this extremization of uh, the portrayal of like an idyllic relationship with the regime and uh, almost, uh, you know, it, is all, it becomes almost the, the, the portrayal of a hope in, in some ways. Uh, because that, I mean, and it's very, if you read, if you go through the joint document, this is very strong until the racial laws. The joint reports are, yes, Europe is a disaster, but fortunately we have Mussolini, which also is tied to other issues of American politics. And even when Mussolini opens the camp, internment camps, um, you know that that's the that's the moment of revelation, and is the moment when uh, the reports become, you know, finally what what they what, you know to reflect reality. No, no, I don't mean that. But the uh, <laughs> professor is right, and you are right because I was a little girl in the Aegean island of Rhodes, and that's what we thought. We thought we are all right with the Italians because everything that is happening in Germany or whatever, but it's over there, you know, it's over there, it's with them. Us, we will never be. Right. I ended up in Auschwitz oh. and, and so did my parents. Well, they were exterminated and that's what happened and you are right. And you are not that right. Because it is, but it wasn't only American politics. We had that feeling. feeling. Mm. We really had that feeling that uh, we are we are okay here. Yeah. Especially was in my the island, the uh, the sun is uh, you know shining and everything is fine. We are uh, you know we are parading. Uh, Mussolini is talking. We are all going there. Duce, 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 and that's what happened. Uh -huh. mm. Uh, I would say something that it's very difficult to say in English. I will, I will, I will try. Mm, uh, I think that Italian Jewry, most of the Italian Jews, uh, understood that the situation was worsening. They don't know how much, and they didn't know. Uh, until what? From just a few weeks after the, uh, the constitution of the first Mussolini uh, government, with the camera speech, uh, the religione cattolica is the dominant religion, uh, religion in Italy. That was a, 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 an enormous change in relation to the liberal state. And uh, it's very difficult to uh, uh, catching the hand, si direbbe in italiano, to, to, to take the, the right behavior because, uh, uh, generally speaking, we are, uh, we know what happened with the politics parties, you know? Uh, Mussolini, uh, the communists, the socialists, the republican, uh, etc., they had a program. Mussolini say this is going to change. Okay, we will add a point at our point, at, at our political program. We want one, two, three, and four. Mussolini say no more uh, uh, press liberty. Okay, we will put a, a third, a quinto punto. Eh? The program is still the same and became more long. For this is how the political parties behavior under. Uh, Dittatura who is, which is building himself. Uh, a minority, that, one minority, doesn't behave in this way. Uh, one minority has a program, wants some kind of liberty and civil rights and equality and so on. When the um, regime, especially a dictatorship, revoke one of these 
civil rights, the problem of the minority make, uh, how to say, uno scalino in basso. Mm -hmm. a, they, a step down. They don't add something. They uh, erase the first uh, <coughs> request, uh, how to say, and they add the new one that became the dominant. So this that led to uh, a, a, a sort of, uh, uh, come si dice, c'è una, una strana uh, unione, uno strano adeguamento an adjustment. From, uh, an adjustment from the minority, a minority composed by old people, uh, and, and children, uh, women, men, and a, lot, a lot of people. And, and it's very difficult to uh, to understand day by day what they are, if the, 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 the problem, the request that they make to the government are re the right one in that moment or, or not. And this link with the problem, with the, the, the matter we told before, that we do not have uh, sufficient studies about uh, how this ruling class was uh, uh, composed, who, who were they, and, and so on. It, it, it it's, uh, um, rende molto difficile l'analisi. This is not a um, osservazione polemica, it's uh, uh, una, una constatazione. I think we can, if there are no, no other questions, we can uh, close. Thank you very much. Thank you.